piss. <laughs> Doesn't need it. What's going on, everybody? Cali Death Podcast back once again, episode one ten. What's going on? I, I, we're back. We're back in action. Had a week off for the holiday. I hope everybody's holiday uh, was everything it could be for you. And uh, here, as always, uh, my resident homies, Joel and Casey. We're going to see Joseph in a little bit. I am Anthony, and tonight we are joined by underground extreme metal extraordinaire mr jordan varela what's going on jordan what's going on guys cheers, cheers dude, dude. Yeah, yes, cheers. absolutely got a couple breakfast thoughts in the cup i'm ready to roll <laughs> oh, yeah. nice, dude so yeah um jordan's drumming has uh always been unique to me I've, I've known about you for a long time coming across the lust of decay early in uh my death metal up and upcomings and um your your style has always you know stood out as i always thought of you as like the some of the busiest limbs in the game hmm. I, your your fills are all, you're just like a fill you just shit fills out all song long <laughs> <laughs> what a compliment i know <laughs> elegant very um, elegant yeah, yeah. Right? Just fills out it's great <laughs> but, in, but they're like the most beautiful shits you've ever seen you know <laughs> <laughs> that's right we got to play with you guys live twice i think right i think we got to play with you guys i remember you guys oh my gosh that was like a thousand years ago when you guys were in spartanburg me and jay were giving you grief in the parking lot which uh, was it a decrepit uh, that was severed that was just severed, that was just severed. Oh, oh, severed. okay, okay. Twice. we played with you guys twice nice dude awesome. that was on that last uh 2013 run that we did or whatever yeah the nice oh. locks the long locks and everything now it's all nice and shaved wait you're talking you're talking about uh, i think you're thinking about dusty dude i didn't no, have long you. hair i never and had long hair long long hair. Hair. Yeah. i know i almost i almost lied and said it was like oh yeah i remember that just because just to not like just to be one of those guys like yeah i saw that movie i totally saw that movie i know what you're talking about like <laughs> i just don't remember nothing about tour oh my gosh <laughs> yeah i've had a bald head pretty much my whole deal dude it's i think true. the first odious show i actually had a, a chuck liddell faux hawk type or not faux hawk, oh, like the, the short little strip that goes down your dome wow no <laughs> I hey what up we got the professor what's going on dude Buddy. likes to profess in the house Yo. Whoop! Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Media Are we live? what's going on i just joined we are live <laughs> You're frozen, but we're live. We're all move. We're, we have live movement. I think all of us, except there he is, frozen professor. <laughs> well, well anyway, so yeah. So yeah. You there, Joseph. Are you still frozen? I think no, I saw. He's him good. Playing. He's good. He looks like I a game two video game, but it's all good. <laughs> so so back, to back to back to Memory Town. So where's Spartanburg? Is that in Massachusetts or in New York? South Carolina, actually. <laughs> so they got Ground Zero yeah, there. That's been like. Okay. Ever since I can remember, that's been the stomping grounds pretty much. I mean, Cannibal, Hate Eternal, all the big bands that would come through. Now it's calmed down a lot over the years. I'm not exactly sure why. That's obviously a lot of that has to do with management, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. it was like the resident, like that was the place to put bands, man. Bay of okay. big bands, D aside, they still come there. But Cannibal, every year used to come there. Hate Eternal, Cataclysm still comes there. Like some of the big bands, but like um gosh man malevolent creation they had a lot of great acts there i haven't seen a lot of nice. those in a while, so i guess i don't know if it's off the beaten path or if it's a money thing i'm, I'm sure there's multiple things involved you know yeah right definitely. right yeah i've noticed that too just with like some of the venues here in the bay area they've kind of kind of shifted all of a sudden you'd see all the shows at one venue and then they go to another one it's kind of like wherever the promoter of the time wants to have the the show more you know whatever whoever treats them better Kind I've of said it get. multiple times though too. I hate that San Francisco is not a spot anymore. You yeah, see all these tours, dude. It's it's Sacramento, which is actually sick because I'll be moving up there. You know, I'll be up there full time. You know, soon. So 
I'll actually have access to those shows, which is awesome. But just Frisco not being a spot on the tour runs anymore kind of is sad, right? That was yeah. like the main spot, dude. It is it is sad, but it's also such a fucking mega city and hassle to get into that I don't really I like like a flat, just easy thing to drive into and then it's like, oh parking's right there. Cool. Let's just go Joe park. Always, he right always if, as soon as we start talking about San Francisco, dude, he's got okay, all yeah. of his fucking it's like anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> no. Hey man, yeah, I mean, place. coming from San Diego, if I gotta go up north, it's like I'd rather go to a show in Orange County. It's the same thing. Like, so yeah, yeah. The LA exit off you just it's like it's all like yeah it's all open. it's like but oh like, let's go to parking you want to like, maybe go get an easy bite to eat and then yeah. some, like you want to like have everything be easy or do you want like ah, like dodging it's, like but still fun, in the room? <laughs> we, we've had some good times though in, in north hollywood like it's fun like on the sunset like the you know the whiskey yeah yeah it's that. just get, it's like one of those like new york places like you get there yeah. and then you're just like all right we're here and it's fun but like on the way there it's like one of the biggest yeah. nightmares like i have dreams about it still <laughs> like sucks yeah. my wife was like my wife the other night was like you know babe we should go sometime to see the tree lighting in new york i'm like no we shouldn't <laughs> yeah. that at all i'm from there i hate that place i don't even yeah, like going back there it is yeah. an absolute disaster but i get it she's from the country we live in a small town and she yeah. you know when she went to new york it was like wow you know yeah, it's like, like a vacation totally. tour. but dude i mean it is absolute mayhem it is freaking totally. mayhem, man you can't park Everything costs twenty eleven million dollars. It's yeah. ridiculous. I know. And you find a parking place, it's like, yeah, it's fifty bucks for like an hour or something. You're like, sick. Yeah. Like, all sketchy with like dilapidated fences, so people just like go through and like easily get to your car. I'm like, sick. So I'm just, you're basically just the last place now. And you're like, oh, supply and demand. I'm gonna go ahead and just raise the prices. Like, you know, it's Absolutely. crazy. Absolutely. But, well, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not talking about tree lightings in the middle of downtown, though. I'm talking about <laughs> underground death metal shows, the fucking outskirt fucking venues that we used to love to go to. Tree yeah. lighting, Come to yeah. Santa Cruz. It's the same thing. Oh, Come on, Joel, bring them to Santa Cruz. I don't want to. That's what anywhere. it is. It's Sacramento and Santa Cruz now, which is good because that that means uh, Joel Cupcakes got his work cut out for him, dude. Totally. Yeah. No, he's but been a shout out to Joel in Cupcake, that. dude. If you go into a metal show in uh, the Santa Cruz area, that motherfucker's involved. Totally. What did you guys get for Christmas? Productions. Um, I got a. Uh, <laughs> I got a T-shirt. Nice. I got a T-shirt as well. I got yeah. a new pirate coin. <laughs> you you got to post it, dude. Coins. You, you got to post it. Paul from Cognizant sent me a shirt. That was awesome. Hell, Hell yeah. yeah! That was so freaking cool. He literally reached out to me one day and said, "Dude, I love your drumming." I'm like, "Dude, th- I love your drummer. He's the best." He's like. Can I hook you up with a shirt? I'm like, I'll pay. And all of a sudden, I get a shirt from the UK. Oh, my oh that's sick. From that Cognizance? Was... Yes. Yeah, I've gotten the, the long sleeve. That that That's a badass shirt, dude. They're such a unique band, too, man. I just I love their droney riffs and split chords and the things they do. They have such a cool writing style, that band. Hell yeah. Yeah, definitely. Then you got Dipole on drums. Like, we don't need any introduction there. So. hmm mm-hmm. That's sick. Actually, I did. I got a shirt actually from Trevor. That's a custom one, and it's got like a banana taped to it, and it's got it says something funny on the front, and then something on the back. I don't know, but um, An he got one for banana taped to it. No, no, he like went to this place and got like a. Yeah, it was there's something gonna be like that is super custom, dude. No, the carry one was great. It was like carry. It was like it was like business in front, and like him all oh, professional, yeah. and then like it was all party in the back, and him like yelling and freaking out all hammered. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> it was just fine. So I was, I guys, I just wanted to say congratulations on man, y'all. You guys are just killing it, man. Like I thought about this today. Like I go back, so like I don't ever watch podcasts. I listen to a couple of Joe Rogan's in the past, you know. Mm-hmm. But like ever since I've been checking out your stuff, I've been going back and listening just through the catalog, you know. Awesome, man. G- guys. Bravo to you, man. Oh, for thanks. So much. Thank awesome you, man. podcast, man. Like y'all like the Joe Rogan of death metal now. Hell like, yeah. <laughs> that's I'll cool. Take that. I'll take that. Like, that's cool, man. Like you guys, I mean, think about it. Look at the catalog of people you guys have spoken yeah, to. Yeah, dude. That's freaking legit, man. It's our pleasure. It's like our, we're so honored, dude. It's so fun. It's like hey, this guy wants to come on. All right, dude. Like, yeah, you know, it's like we're just stoked to be talking to anybody, dude. Like, in you, like, it does, you know, it's like anyone that comes on, we're stoked, like, equally stoked, you know. Shout out Mega Mike, too. He's another fucking oh. sick. Oh, yeah, uh, we got to get him on a uh, Twitch. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, we're gonna have, I think I messaged you. I don't know, but I want to get him on for sure. But, uh, yeah, he's Let's doing do cool it. things. He's one of the, when you jump onto Twitch, that whole world, he was one of the first people I caught on to and was like, damn, this is entertaining. He's like, you know. Holding it down, I don't know why I'm going off on a limb on that. On a <laughs> but yeah, Jordan, no, I, I, that's really cool to hear you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Say that, dude, just because 
we've said it before but this thing started out just as an experiment you know and and yeah it started out strong with the first four episodes from our scene you know all the legends of the cali scene it kind of just like fell into place and it just kind of snowballed into the point where yeah we started reaching out further and we still have uh upcoming episodes you know that are are really really uh, amazing that we got them to work and we're very excited for them too and yeah the fact that um, this thing has gotten to the point where now we can dip our toes in those ponds too sure it, it really is uh, yeah and all we're doing is just fucking being metal nerds who like to party and talk shit dude and, you know it's and, habitual and, now it's like a habit for all of us like we don't even think twice about thursday we're like oh yeah like who's coming on this week okay all right it's like a normal like conversation i hear go around mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. all right and then, then the flyer then joseph makes a sick flyer we post it and then i'm like all right so that's what we're doing this week and then yep. and then we're like who else and then we have we start to run out of guests a little bit and then we get into like fun like booking mode and we who can beside we work like, beside work it's the only thing that's like 100 scheduled into my week you know i'm gonna yeah, go yeah. spend i'm gonna go spend time with the family but i mean there isn't really any solid plans with that other than just being together but i know that i gotta punch in monday through friday for work and i gotta do the podcast on thursday nights those are the two main things that are locked in for my week and i'm stoked you know yeah the thing that people fail to realize sometimes too man and i know you guys are gracious of it is like you know you people have really failed to understand this this concept a person's time god has given us 24 hours in a day not 23 and a half and not 25 he's given mm-hmm. us 24 probably five or six or seven or eight you sleep the rest you're working you got to have time with the family so when somebody takes that two three hours or whatever it may be like even when hobbs was on i know we had a shorter session with you guys but you know that dude's busy he's always interviewing he's always talking he's writing music he's practicing there and Alcatraz playing, whatever it may be. Right. Fact, that guy's like, hey, here's two hours of devoted time to you guys. That's a big deal, man. Totally, dude. Absolutely. And we're very, very grateful for it every single time. And uh mm-hmm. it's it's kind of amazing how there's certain guys that you wouldn't you would think that would be those one hour interviews, and then we end up getting four hour interviews sure. out of them, you know, and and then they stay friends after that too. It's just yeah, a lot of the these things that we did not anticipate at all, but we are over two years into this thing. It's a well-oiled machine. We enjoy doing it every single week. It's a, a beacon for a lot of people. Um, we obviously love our underground, you know, bubble that we've been a part of for decades. And it's cool to see that it's still moving forward and there's new generations and things are evolving and we're becoming the old guys now. And we're, it's, it's still just, it, it's cool to be a part of it still and, and still have the love to be able to sit and do this for a couple hours a week where we just literally talk shop and talk about all the great things that, that we love about being musicians in this. Cause it, it's, it's, it is really about the art, first in this type of music because where the fuck's the money guys playing our shit there's none right so it's it is just the art and and that's why we can sit and talk about it nonstop because we've been doing it even in the beginning that what we're doing is out in between bands we're all bullshitting smoking cigarettes smoking joints getting ready for the next band what are we talking about we're talking about fucking death metal then too you know right so yeah and we love doing it and we're still doing it now uh, death metal is for you it's pretty funny it's kind of like this weird virus my brother when we first got into it he's like oh you're fucked it's gonna be a new thing that you're gonna be all about you talk about it when you're not listening to it and like it's just kind of get to combine all the covid staying away from each other and get together still and yep. back room it you know so mm-hmm. i love it we, yeah we missed the green room talk so we end up just making virtual ones and Joseph is the only one that's actually having a lot of green room talks because he's playing shows all the time compared to all of us. He's probably played like more yeah. shows during the podcast than I've ever done in my touring life. That's not true. <laughs> Absolutely not true. <laughs> I uh, I counted. I, I think I played 40 shows this year. Nice. Yeah. And that's that's exactly. actually, man, that's quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Quite definitely. A bit, I think yeah. I th- between 30 and 40, I'm very proud. It's by far the that's most I've played. 
it's yeah, crazy. Man. We're 14 minutes already into this. We didn't mention Battle Forge Coffee real quick. We got to get you guys <laughs> battleforgecoffee.com, all that shit. The plugs. We didn't get Jordan's plugs. We got some things that we probably didn't want to discuss. Joel, uh, Joel, Joseph's got a tour that was just announced, all that stuff. We got to get through all that shit. So with the, with, with the battleforgecoffee.com, go do your thing with there. But with the Cali Death Podcast. com, do we have the pre order shit set up yet? I just. I just need Joel to uh, reply to. I know I'm message. looking at the message. I remember <laughs> we were talking, and I was like, "Whatever, what, just tell me how much, what, what, what kind of money." And then I, he might have sent it, but I went to. <laughs> I've been busy. I, I didn't Christmas get that. Shit. I never got that. So uh, basically, we are ready to launch uh, a pre-sale campaign for our newest merch drop. So that'll I be announced. It. I sent it to someone the... else. <laughs> <laughs> Sick, dude. Uh, so as soon as Joel. <laughs> As soon as Joel replies with a affirmative <laughs> on a question, um, then we'll we'll have merch for you guys. I'm really stoked on it. And it's going to be with uh, We Need Merch. Uh, it's going to be really good quality. And uh, yeah, I'll ship it out just like I've done all the other merch here. So And it's going to be the full color um, new design that you would have seen as the cover of the episode 100. Mm-hmm. We, we're dropping that and we're dropping another og edition. updated version mm-hmm. where we're swapping the Jedi. logo position yeah um and as far as other shout outs uh one of the 40 shows i played was chicago domination fest with jordan uh playing oh, yeah. with both that was so good that was so good that fest that was such a Hell fucking yeah. sick fest. Was... That was one of the most fun shows of my life. Hell yeah. And uh and you what, played what? with Lust Lust of Decay and Shuriken sure. Cadaveric Entwinement. Did that I get that right? That was the first show ever. Yep. In Entwinement oh, yeah. or Entwinement? I forget. Entwinement. Yeah. Entw- Shuriken Cadaveric Entwinement, your first show ever. So we got to share the right. stage. Was it the, that day or no, we cuz our, our band played on Saturday. You yeah. guys were on Friday, right? No. Um, we played so Lust of the K played because it was Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right? So we played thir- Lust of the K played Thursday at like a beautiful time slot, and then Shuriken played that Saturday. We played at like seven thirty, I think, and then you guys played that night late. Uh, okay, hell yeah! So we did share the stage that night. Yep. Sorry yep. if you're getting crackling. I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Um, but yeah, man. So I got to see Jordan kill it, and he's still an amazing drummer, amazing live performer. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, introduce us as as bands uh, or guys who've played together. That's all. Hell yeah, dude! Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I um, I'll give a shout out to um my stick endorser. It's actually me and more sticks. Um, absolute clubs. Nice. He actually makes a custom stick for me called Heaven Hammer. So that's my nickname, Heaven Hammer. Oh, yeah. and, um, there's a hell's hammer there's a heaven hammer we have to have the antithesis right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah we gotta have an antithesis maybe we'll have a drum off one day um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I got, I got, <laughs> sticks he makes me some horsepower sticks it's actually a pretty funny story behind those sticks we can talk about later but um them and pearl drums and, and peisty one day hopefully get on board with those guys that would be something nice. um again my buddy nate burgard out of um out of billy he's one of my closest friends he actually sold me my kit um, and him, him and I talk drums nonstop and, uh, you know, my bandmates and less the decay and yeah. I, and you guys, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I really appreciate you. Hell yeah, dude. Okay. And, uh, real quick where people can uh, buy merch for any of those bands yes. that, and Concord shrunken yep. cadaver entwinement. Lust of Decay, all those places. Sure. Um, I know, I know this band camp, I believe we have, um, I know that comatose music is the big, is one of the big labels. Um, mm-hmm. so that's Steve, my guitarist, he actually owns that label. He actually released the Shuriken. He also releases the Lust of Decay. We will be. Am I, am I pronouncing it wrong? Am I saying Shrunken when I should be saying Shuriken? Shuriken. It's a, it's it's Shuriken. <laughs> so we're a bunch of we're a bunch of rednecks out here. We want to try to sound sophisticated. <laughs> you know what I mean? We want to sound smart. We're real. Uh, I mean, it's par for the course for me to fuck up a band. <laughs> I know. We. I wish we could dude. like. I wish throughout the podcast that we like dialed in exactly what. Things, things that, that uh, fucked Anthony up. fucked up, so we could just have like a quick, like a like a fucking a compilation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where is that crackle? Yeah, that that crackle? Yeah. Going, I, going I muted. I muted. I muted. Uh, is it from him? Yeah. Uh, yeah, him. yeah. It's just it's a snap crackling. It's all good. Sorry, but uh, figure it out. 
Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Comatose, comatose, yeah. music. Um, comatose then, music. Comatose music. Oh. music. Okay. Yeah, music. Yeah. And then, and then me, I, I handle. You can go to Vision of God Records. Um, they handle. That's actually my label that I'm on with In Conquer. That's my Christian solo uh, death metal project. Mm-hmm. I'm on. I'm gonna sign like a seven eight this deal with that guy. So I'm gonna be there for a minute. Nice. Um, so you can go to him. Also, he has Christian Metal Underground. Um, and then also me, I do a lot. You know, I, I'm doing pre-sales now. I should have the new and conquered out in the wide path to the Lake of Fire coming in. I'm hoping by tomorrow or by Monday. Shipping's been really off at the holidays, but I should have those. And um, so I do a lot of my own self-shipping and whatnot, so which is great. You got a band camp for those that people um, that, they- that I don't. Um, I I think that vision of God does, and I have to talk to him. I actually never even ask exactly what it is. That's me dropping the ball. Um, because mm-hmm. honestly, guys, I'm so old school, like. The fact that I even know how to turn my computer on is a miracle. Dude, so, they have to they have to send me a link in my email because I don't know how to sign on to any other thing on a computer. It really my email, dude. Yeah, it, it's <laughs> yeah, there's there's so much backstory to me with technology. Like, dude, I grew up in the metal scene not using any of this, dude. We would yeah. plug our triggers and guitars up and play and had MySpace. That was it. You know? <laughs> so all this stuff is so new to me, man. You know? MySpace was great. Shout out. MySpace, MySpace was freaking awesome. Yeah, it was. It was a great way to. I met all these guys through MySpace. I met Casey and Joel through MySpace. Yeah. That's true. You did. Yeah. And fucking first audio song I ever yeah. heard: MySpace, Caverns of yeah. Reason, dude. And I was like, "What the fuck is this shit, dude?" Just the format. Oh, I can get you back. Okay. I remember, I like, back. pretty sure, like, yeah, black. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you sound good. Pretty sure, all like, right. Black Dahlia Murder, like. If you were like typed at black dolly murder doc like back in the day, you type like dot com, it would just go to their MySpace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like oh, yeah, just thing. forward. It's it. just like no, I don't even need a website anymore, dude. Just but it was instantly yeah, it was, starts playing music for you. It's got like, like it's got yeah. their you know got this is what we're all about. Yeah, yeah it's just like, like boom, and you want to get views and and all that shit, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. a cool yeah. way to network. It, it was it just, just yeah. Happened. The uh, you know totally. there would be no yeah. other way that Dave Haley would have heard Carnivorous if there wasn't a MySpace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Everything kind of sucked after that, dude. It was just like wasn't it kind of sucked. I don't know. It's just like <laughs> fuck, dude. Yeah, I kind of want. I kind of want to put a song on my uh, Facebook profile. Oh, see, it's Facebook even. No, and then I say Instagram. And then you're like Instagram's fucking boomer shit. What, too. What's it's Facebook? Like, yeah, you, you, you mean yeah, that? yeah. I know that's gonna be a thing of the past too. I mean, maybe we'll see. I mean, yeah. but it could be like another MySpace in like 20 years. You know, it was like remember Facebook? So, I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> I was so anti Facebook when it first started popping up. First yeah. of, again, this is me being as archaic as I am. I was too, by the way. Yeah, yeah so it's like, hey, check out Facebook. I'm like, I'm going on that crap. Yeah. So finally, I checked it out, and then I started seeing classmates out there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen this person since the war. Yeah, yeah. You know? And yeah. then like, I started seeing family members. So I'm like, you know what? All right, this is actually a good way to keep up with family. So I got, I bought into it. And yeah. that's what got me licked on. That's, that's the that's same. Cool. That's the same shit yeah, I was, sure. dude. I kept in. I kept it close with family and friends, and then I started doing uh, even during the bands. I I wouldn't uh, use social. Uh, I still don't use social media. My Instagram sucks. I still don't use it. I, I, add, fucking, I add stories and hopefully the three hundred people that follow me. Yeah, on your Instagram, Instagram fucking sucks. Well, it's it's terrible. Terrible. <laughs> like, like every time I look at it, I'm like, <laughs> it's so like, terrible. <laughs> like he only uses it for like messaging and like. Saying what, like, laugh. We used to like in the behind the scenes to like send stuff and laugh. I wonder the it. percentage of people that go to my shit that from the podcast and then they get to my thing and they're like, wait, did I did I click a wrong button? Is this it's the right a Kelly guy? Death logo at least or something? Like, I there's, know, like, I there's like two pirate coins and like I'm like, look at it. And I, <laughs> I, get, I, get, <laughs> I get I get fucking dusty looking that's at the, it, dude. That's the first. Uh, the first. I mean, that's the reason why I got on Instagram was because of that shit. Oh was, my gosh, dude, know, it's so you know, good. I know it's funny, dude. <laughs> But I think you're doing it no, I think now, like Anthony's got to a point now where he's like, "Dude, it's fucking pirate coins. I'm sticking to it. I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna put any that." He always love, digs his toes it. at the sand with every I fucking good pirate <laughs> he's just coin. Yeah, he's just all. This is what makes this show so great. Like you got the four best personalities. You got Joel, who's like cool. Yeah. I'm like, hey, go tell your mom we're having a beer. Come check out this death metal band. We got grown up dad Tropany tra- 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 over there. We got yeah. the philosophical Joseph over there. Like, well, the angle of the dangles is equally proportional to the human uh, thing. Then yeah. we got cool pimp Casey who just smiles the whole time. But when he says something, it's like, holy crap, this is prolific. 
<laughs> yeah, dude. It's, and that's what you would that's what you'd find if you're sitting in a living room at a house party, dude. Oh, I love it, dude. It's kind of yeah, yeah. personalities, you know. Fuck oh, yeah. Thank you. But yeah, dude. All Enough right. about us, dude. Let's get into yeah. you. Yeah. Sure. Whatever you guys want so, to talk about. Right, Anthony, do the, even, do it. Yeah, let's do, do the it. damn thing. You, you you've been watching this enough, you know where we like to go. Absolutely. As far back as possible. Sure, man. I've got a lot of backstory, man. Um, so let's see, I'm 43 now. Um, music literally, and, I, and like I said, I, I love, I watched all y'all, a lot of your stuff. So I kind of understand the same kind of concepts. A lot of people, man, it was art running in the family. Mm -hmm. um, my mother played guitar. She sang, she was also into art. My father actually was a Mac daddy jock, second in state in wrestling in New York, which is a tall, tall order. If you know anything about uh, collegiate wrestling, um, mm -hmm. soccer jock, track job, he was just like stud. a specimen. Yeah. I was not, I was a fat slob in high school. I hated sports. I just loved drums. Like I was the total, like he, he I think my dad hated me for years because I didn't, I didn't do any of that, but well, um, there's always that one little area where the son and the dad bump yeah. heads, dude, this, for a this while. Sucks. This yeah. is garbage. Put on a, a, yeah. a onesie and go yeah. wrestle, you know? Um, but for me, he actually was a really good artist. He drew really well. So I started thinking back. I'm like, wow, I actually have artistic family. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, man, honestly, like I, I remember when MTV started in 80, right? So I was born in 79, 80, 81. I remember sitting on the floor. And if you ever know, if you know me, everybody knows I rock. When I sit, I'm always rocking. Yeah. So I've been doing that since I was one. I'd be watching Judas Priest on MTV or Ozzy. And I would just sit on the floor looking at the TV doing that. So I was turned on to metal when I was one, two. Wow. And yeah, man. So, and my mother, what's really, she is awesome. She always, always, she loved it, man. Like she was all about me doing music. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really cool. She never, never dissuaded me from it. And um, I got. Uh, my, uh, do you have siblings? So I had two, two half sisters and a, bro and a half brother. Very far in age difference, though. I'm the oldest. Okay. Like we're talking like 13, 14 years. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, none of them. My, I'm sorry. My brother actually, yes, he is a musician. He was a violinist, which is a very tough instrument. So he was a violinist. Yeah. Which I want to slap him for quitting because he he could he was getting really good at it. It's one of my favorite instruments too. Absolutely. He was getting invited to do weddings and stuff for people. Like good good side money. Um, he stopped playing that, and then my sisters they're not not musical at all on my on my father's side um sport related my sister's like a jock and all that so it's kind of funny it kind of runs in the genetics um so yes yeah, so man so i started doing drums at eight i started playing at eight um i was i grew up in long island nice. That's cool. yeah so i grew up in long island um i started playing in elementary school you know with the elementary school band and we had it was funny we had I remember four other drummers with me, so it all had the snare line and everything. We were learning notes and theory and stuff like that at the young age. And uh, really cool story. I had a jazz drummer teacher, Mr. Letty. I'll never forget this guy. He was, man, he was unbelievable, man. He would do traditional grip, and this guy would just crush it. He'd get on. It was pretty cool. So it's like awesome. after we would practice, we would be able to go in the room and all jam out for a couple minutes apiece. Mm -hmm. And I'd always wait to last on purpose because I knew that I would be able to shine with him and I wanted his critique, even at a young age. So I would just go off, dude. And I remember one day he said to me, man, he said, uh, you are special. He said, I don't know what that looks like yet because you're young, but you're really special. And that really still to this day resonates in my heart because that was really cool to hear that from an adult authority as good mm -hmm. as him. Mm -hmm. um, cool, for sure so, yeah because that could be like a make or break moment in your life and then sure you know, say that yep. and then it makes age. you lean into doing it versus not well you got kids right you know if you tell your eight-year-olds hey dude that sucks they're gonna be like dang man really dad like they're yeah. like all right i'm not gonna do that like they're very impressionable at that age right totally so yeah no you got to be careful what you say to uh young children because it will embed itself for maybe even the rest of their lives. You know? Hold on to it for a long time. Yeah. You're, you guys are 100% accurate. So from there, I think that was, yeah. So third grade, fourth grade, 
fifth grade, I wound up going to a new school right around the corner. And it was it was awesome, man, because I got to play in two bands. I got to play in the concert band and I got to play in the jazz band. I was the only drummer. So the concert band was cool because it was your traditional snare, maybe maybe bass drum with a hi-hat and a rim shot, kind of very low-key music, but it was cool because I had two different teachers and the one teacher was very on it, very precise, notes, theory, let's go. Yeah. And then yeah. the jazz, the jazz section was freaking cool, man. We got to we got to, we covered the Rocky song. We did some cool stuff at a young age. Nice. And dude, they let me have free rent. He was like, Jordan, you're good. I trust you. And take your sticks and let's have some fun. And that was so cool. He even gave me a drum solo in like one song we played. Um, awesome. So it was cool to like to see like the trajectory for me at a young age. Because I, I still really do remember because I'm very passionate about drums. The trajectory was really kicking up a notch, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going to supposedly, from what I was hearing, the... Some of the uh, the musical teachers are talking to my mother. They wanted to kind of groom me to be like, okay, we, we see your son going here. Let's let's get him with the proper lessons and let's teach him more theory and start going there. Well, uh, not to go down a rabbit hole, but, you know, my mother was a single mother working a lot of jobs. I started getting into trouble at a young age. So then my father, who was a drill sergeant, he was like, my stepmother was like, you're coming to North Carolina, period. That's it. There's no way fans or buts about it. So I was so upset because... I wanted to stay in New York because I knew that my drumming could have potentially went somewhere there. Well, God mm -hmm. had plans for me, you know, and when I came here, how old were you? I was, uh, so this is, uh, 11, right at 11, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yep. That's about right. Yeah. Timeline, like fifth grade or 10, 11 years old. Yeah. So when I came here, it was, it was really the same kind of thing, you know, elementary school band, but this is when I started becoming, becoming rogue because we did the same thing, right? We'd have the four or five drummers. We'd all be learning rudiments and theory and all that, which is very important. I kicked myself in the fanny for not learning the stuff accurately because that would have really helped me in my drumming. But basically, I started, I started kind of like in sixth grade, I was like, I hate this. Like we're coming to band practice. I'm hitting a snare drum. I'm hitting a cymbal. Like it's like this sucks. Like I can't stand this. And I did it for the year. And I, and I said, you know what? I just want to play by myself and just find band members. And that's what I did. And then after that, seventh yeah. grade, you know what I mean? You know how it is, man. You meet people in junior high that you think everybody that's got long hair plays metal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I, I got, I'll go for it. Did you have to do that thing where you like wait like 37 bars for your next hit? Oh my god, oh, count and you're like one, <laughs> like two, and you're like, wait, 14, 15. Shit. Oh no. You have to lose it. It's like uh, is it, what is that? Like timpani? Is I that... did oh well, no, that's like symphonic. I mean, I did symphonic band, concert bands, like yeah. the same concept. Like I did percussion and look, it wasn't what I ended up doing, but I did that a bit, you know. So you're in the sheet music, you're looking at like you don't know, you're like all of a sudden space off yeah. for a second, you have to be like, oh shit, oh. uh to follow the other well, instrument it, that yeah. I've lost. Yeah. Well, it's like you're playing, and then there's like all of a sudden, like, 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 so the repeat bar is like the line with the two, it looks like a percentage two thing. Yeah. Right. Like, like, repeat bar, you can do two or like combined or like one bar. But like, say it's like, it'll just be like one bar, <clears throat> and it'll just like 37. So it's like 37 <laughs> bars you have to wait. And then it's oh like, oh my God. And then it's like after 30, and then on the 38th bar, you have to like, boom, and like hit that beat. And if you don't, <laughs> like, like the conductor like looks at you like, you lost like, your mind. Like what are you nightmare. doing? Like you have one job. Wait it's, five oh minutes to get a symbol. Yeah, it's super stressful. Thirty-seven. Like, like I mean, you're like 23, just, 24. Yeah. Or you're like, wait, did I see twenty-five? Oh no. And then it's like you're like one off, and then it's just like they're just like. That's oh. why you gotta gets... know the other parts. You gotta. Listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, no one wants to count that long, so you're just like, I know that the trumpet starts four bars before my part, so exactly. I just wait for the trumpet. Yeah. You, yeah, you gotta trumpet. like. Get, yeah, that's you why he's the yeah. professor. Exactly. Guys. Of course, the what about, professor. Has an <laughs> but what about like? Do you have like the trumpet? The well, the conductor is he is because he's a conducting. Is he gonna give you like a little something? Do you have anything coming your way where he's like, all right, you're you like well, watching him, or you're lost? Yeah. You got to figure yeah, that yeah. out in rehearsal. Is he going to give you something or is he going to be like, I'm too busy. You're going to have to come in while I yeah, get yeah. the flutes, their little thing or whatever. Well, so. What you're saying is 100, Joseph, what you're saying is 100% right. Because I remember in my fifth grade band, my, my, my teacher, he was a really, really, he was really, really good. And 
I remember we were playing the song and I was jamming and he was, you know, he, I knew certain cues that he would do, you know, keeping time. And, but then he did something with his hands and I thought it, it looked like he was telling me to stop. So I stopped. He's like, I'm like, okay. <laughs> what here, man? Yeah. That's awesome. Damn. Right, conducting, right, you know? conducting is a beautiful art. It's underrated. And, uh, I consider I going into it, it, it'd be very fun to do. And it's, you get to play other people, you know, like, and they're your instruments. It's, it's hardcore. It's cool. It's conducting. Yeah. Like, it's like the difference between having like, you know, when you see those people that are doing the sign language on the side and then you find out there's one person that's like faking it and they just like suck. Uh. <laughs> like, and, like, and you're just like, all of a sudden you're just coming into her like, what the fuck is this guy doing? You like, I don't know if they're classically trained musicians. I think yeah. that would cause a issue pretty quick. If the conductor is not, they, they know exactly what's if he's a fraud. Out. Oh yeah. yeah. No, if you don't play your part, like exactly like they, they like know, and they'll just like, it's like they have like seven brains at the same time. And they'll just like, look at you while they're like still conducting. And you're just it's, like, it's kind of <laughs> cool to think of it. Like, yeah, Am I in you're, trouble? Me, in trouble? you're in you're big trouble. Me, sure. You're making me think of the, the, that being in that position, you kind of, yeah, you conduct the way a piece is played. Mm -hmm. There is the sheet music that everybody follows, but the like feel and emotion can be changed by you as a conductor. Well, yeah, like like classical music breathes, you know, like it's a different like a dynamic. Of, yeah, 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 like it, like the rhythm can slow down and breathe and speed up, like based on mm -hmm. the feel of the, the expression and the conductor and all that kind of business you're talking about. So it's yeah. like a different thing, like than like we're used to, like with you know pop and rock and metal and stuff like that. Or mm -hmm. and also the conductor can hear from like a privileged vantage what's going on that where you're sitting you're not actually able to hear what it sounds like outside so the conductor mm. will be like you need to play louder even if you can't tell he's that live so, mixing he's mixing that yeah, live oh. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. sound that's guy crazy. like you know <laughs> that's a mm. tall order man if you're that if you're yeah. the, if you're the conductor of the train you're doing that man like that's that's legit you're you're legit you're able yeah. to yeah. Handle every instrument you could pretty much get on there pretty much school every single person that's on that instrument no dum dum this is how you do this Mm -hmm. Have you yeah. all seen that movie Whiplash? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, dude. that freaking movie. That movie was a train. That's, ride. Really, that's an intense <laughs> movie, dude. That movie's ridiculous. When I want to <laughs> laugh, some days I'll just put on six. Yeah, yeah. Blue person, I'll just be like, exactly. <laughs> <That's so> <laughs> Do you think it, it ever? Do you think it was that brutal? Like uh, as in Whiplash, because that's like. Like what is it? Like one of those based on a true story. <laughs> uh, it was not lightly based on like Charlie Parker's. Like oh, he was it? Story of having something thrown at him, and then he came back, and then like, like shredded or something mm. like that. Like way Not back. Quite tempo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, dude. That movie's <laughs> a good one. It's all about Not the weird. The, have you seen the Weird Al Yankovic like a uh, fucking parody of that? Where he's doing no, that? dude. I want to. Like, want, dude, I want to watch it now. Weird it's, Al, like like Whiplash, uh, dude. That's don't even watch the. He's movie. playing the accordion. Don't even watch the movie. <laughs> it's Is way it better. Than the <laughs> oh yeah. Because Weird Al does that. He like, he, you know, he's done that for years. He shreds like, on the accordion, he, dude. He, he like cuts himself into like films and shit. Like, dude. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's awesome, like, the accordion, dude. and he's like, play faster. He's like, what? Like, and it's like, you know, the guy's like, not quite my tension. He's, he's like, come on, yeah. man. He's like, dude, it's so good. It's, that sounds. It funny. is stressful. It is. I mean, like seeing that. I mean, there's that. It's been so long since I saw it. I saw it like when it first came out, but I remember just the scene where the, the guy's like bleeding and he's like keeping him going and shit. And I'm like, Jesus yeah. fucking yeah, Christ. That, whoever like, that. The fucking uh, insurance commercial guy. He's been in so many movies, but that dude played that part like a Jeez. motherfucker, dude. They could not have bet. Nobody else would have filled that part. Yeah, yeah, nobody. yeah. They needed him. He had to do that. You know, forgive you know, me for not knowing his name because he's been in a lot of good shit and he's always been good, but never oh, knew. Who, who you believe him. Yeah, what's his what name? I mean? Oh yeah, what is his name? God damn it! Um, I think yeah, it's Bob Saget. No, <laughs> oh, J.K. Simmons. J.K. Simmons. Oh, is it yep. J.K. Simmons? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, sorry, I know he passed away. I say Bob Saget for everything. It's, well, whatever, dude. That's just a name. It's also a bunch of passwords at my house. If you guys want any access to me. <laughs> no, it's one password that I never use. It's fine. But yeah, no, I, um, like that's 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 kind of how that transition. You know, so. Kinda, I want to rewind it a little bit because I want to know about like what you were listening to, how you're exposed to m certain music, what all, that journey as well. Well, that's, and, that, and that's, it's perfect time in there because I was still, 
let's put it this way. I grew up listening to uh, Maiden and Priest, <clears throat> Ozzy, um, Crocus, like all the old bands, you know, obviously and when we were young. But Judas Priest was like that was my freaking jam. I had right. I had best of the best Judas Priest, and I think I think the tape broke in my tape player. That's how much I listened to that album. Nice, you know, like that was my jam. Stained class, like that, like Judas yeah. Priest, like you know, sin after sin, like come on, man, like that's just classic material. And Maiden, like dude, the original Iron Maiden, and then you know, Killers, yeah. like man, like dude, like, and then. So, like, not to get too fast forward, but you're right. Like, from there, I was listening to all that music. And then I remember I was in, I still lived in New York at the time. So, this is before I moved, right? The thing that really changed the course for me in music was I was at a, my mother would put me to summer camp, right? For a couple of weeks. And it was, I had the coolest freaking counselor, man. This dude, like, this dude was metal straight up. He had long, dark hair. He wore metal shirts. And I used to just joke around and call him King Diamond. I didn't know who freaking King Diamond was. I was <laughs> he said, dude, you know who you and King Diamond is? I'm like, nah. He's like, stop. Go buy Conspiracy. I'm like, okay. I went yeah. out, they bought me Conspiracy, and do that right there. That album changed my life. Wow. Hell yeah. Mickey D is the frick. That guy's an animal. I don't care what anybody mm -hmm. says. I blasted that album going to get my drum stuff from my buddy Nate. Dude, I could not. I couldn't stop listening to a, a minute of it. Like it is the absolute quintessential perfect '90s metal album. Or it was it was that I forgot was '89 or '90. Something, but, yeah, yeah. But like that album totally changed it for me. And then, real quick, did you have that counselor more than once, or was that just a one time just deal? One time, man. And he was the coolest dude, man. I, wow. Honestly, I wish I remember his name because, yep, absolutely. I would have to say the reason I drum. Um, but yeah, man, I wish I remembered his name because I would try to hit him up on Facebook and say, dude, I appreciate you helping to kind of unlock my journey as a metal drummer and metal musician, you know? Wow. And then, you know, to what you were saying, like, I went into seventh grade and then that's when I think Arise came out. Yeah, Arise oh, came yeah. out. So yeah, seventh grade Arise came out. I started blasting Sepultura. I just started getting into Napalm Death. I didn't really understand, like, um, eighth grade, I remember, um, um, what's that album, I Abstain? Um, Utopia Banished came out. Mm -hmm. I hated it. And it's mm -hmm. because I didn't understand what a blast beat was. I didn't understand why these guys were doing that. You know what I mean? Like, it just didn't make sense to me because I was so used to Max, you know, the Cavalera brothers. You know, everything yeah. was a perfect groove. It was in your face, but there really wasn't, bah, 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 and there wasn't any of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then all of a sudden I found Cannibal Corpse. Well, there we go. A Butcher to Birth came out. I was in eighth grade. Dude, I'm like, who is this freak? This guy's an alien. So would you go to a record store and just flip through your shit, or how are you so, discovering man, this? I met some cool people in junior high, man, just some like-minded people. And you look at them and be like, this guy doesn't listen to metal. He would never, ever peg this guy. And that's usually how it is, right? Mm -hmm. So one of my buddies was like, dude, check out this album, Carcass Heartwork. Boom. Sold. Oh, so, oh, come yeah. On. yeah. I mean, come on. You know that. <laughs> and, then, and then I would get, you know, you remember the old samplers you'd get from Nuclear Blast and all these mm -hmm. guys? Totally. Uh, all these awesome bands. So I started, that's how my journey started opening up, yeah. you know, Mortician. We know yeah, they, were, they weren't a polished band, but they were freaking brutal, man. Relapse yeah. compilation samplers were the fucking raddest yeah. shit, dude. Relapses, Turned yeah. me on to so many great records that I still love to this day from buying those. Because they give you like a double disc 40 track. Right? Like, yeah, here's, a, here's a serious sample. sampler. Dude. Yeah, here's you had so much. The cool, It was so cool Like how like now we have the, you know, the opportunity to just be like, oh, I'll hear a second of it. I'm over it. <laughs> like back then it's like you have to dig through stuff to you know it's like you have to listen to the fucking compilation like you wouldn't be like oh i know this one yeah. band i'm just gonna skip to this one song it's like i don't know any of these bands and it's coming from a place where i know good music is coming from so i have to listen to all of this you know like i have yeah. to like, sit here with my adhd whatever the fuck i have just sit there and be like all right fucking get through it <laughs> you know like listen to it you know when i heard when i heard dennis ritchie i'm like yeah. dude what is this guy's on crack like that's yeah. not Gloom Grim reality like that, that wasn't real drumming, but mm -hmm. it was. He, I mean, that was a scary band. Dude, who was totally. doing that back then? Nobody was yeah. doing that. Come on. Yeah, exactly. He said record and he went, that's what he did. 
Yeah. You know, there wasn't quantizing. There wasn't, hey, let's go back and let's fix this crap. That's crap. That's look. Nobody had money to do that unless you were more of an angel. Nobody was doing yep. that. Then Dennis Ritchie warmed up, got on his drums, and he freaking took off. You know, so all these bands I started hearing, I'm like, oh my gosh, like this is crazy. This is not just you know finding a you know a relapse band or in, in the, the record store roadrunner band. There's so much out there. And it was all mainly just chasing the drummers, finding the sickest drummers. 100 percent then and then <laughs> let's 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 keep progressing here then i found monstrosity imperial doom Come oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i mean lee lee is an animal lee harrison i yeah. still to this day will listen to that album and go how yeah yeah okay. no that was sh- another that was another thing okay. that i was hearing in that shirkin cadaveric entwinement i was finding the monstrosity influence in there as well in dark purity was i mean for me as a kid in dark purity was like just the I mean, on the guitar i was like what the fuck like this is the catchiest <laughs> coolest gro- yeah <laughs> like grooviest death metal i've seen in a long like i'm ever probably up to, the, up to this point like they were they were that one band that i was like they should have probably been in the top you know five death metal bands i think that like when they released that album this is a fucking every song's a hit you know it's like yeah. for me it's like every song's like everyone i show it to people randomly to this day and they're not they're not into death metal and they're like they're like fuck yeah this is sick you know like yeah, man, like, yeah. when they supported that they record up. when they supported that record and they came to the pound they played two slayer covers in a row i was like dude nobody's ever done two slayer covers <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good it's spoiled, that's good it's spoiled. yeah 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 awesome. yeah man like that was and honestly what we're talking about the big thing that really started igniting me was was really a lot of the samplers um you know, and, and seeing what, what all these bands are doing, hearing Conqueror and then hearing um, I loved Ill Disposed, old Ill Disposed, Big Bo on vocals, you know, and um, and then that turned into Panzer Christ and all these awesome bands that came later on. But like, it's cool to see how, as I was younger, just seeing even in such a short time, the level of progression in metal, like, oh my gosh, dude, this is such a big mm-hmm. world. Even though it's such a small world, it was such a big world for me, you know? So that's when I said, okay, I want to elevate my drumming and I got to find some dudes to jam with, you know? So in seventh grade, when I started opening my eyes a little bit and Sepultura and some of these bands, I started just meeting random guys. And a lot of these guys didn't really like metal, but they just wanted the jam. Right. So that's what it was about. You know, we weren't really great, but we just wanted to sit down and just play music. And we just, you know, hit record on a little tape player deck in that had two little speakers and we would just record demos. I think it was the greatest thing on earth. Mm -hmm. Um, as I progressed through junior high, you know, like any young kid, I would still play my drums, but it was kind of lackluster for about a year or so. I actually remember that. I think it was like eighth grade. It was kind of lackluster. I was kind of up and down. You know, I I, put, I was living with my parents. I had a garage. You know, I, I don't want to piss my neighbors off, but thankfully my neighbors were pretty cool. So sometimes they'd come down just to hear me play and support, you know, so it was kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> ninth grade, I started getting really much more serious with it and um again playing with some random musicians and, and I, there was actually a couple older guys that i started jamming with and then again just you know a lot of the same bands just getting introduced to some new bands um basically i was very young so i couldn't really get into clubs yet and stuff but once i got to 10th grade that's when things that's when it took off for me i was I was getting better. My nervous system was responding the way it should have been to, to playing and practicing a lot. That's when, if we rewind to the beginning before we even started the podcast, I was telling you guys about the guy that produced the Shuriken, produced the first two, uh, the first two in Concords. He actually re- uh, recorded the last cesspool. I wasn't on that. That was Brent for the original drummer for Lust of Decay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually, it's kind of funny in 10th grade, I walked down the halls and I would just see random people. And I went to a school that was pretty rich, pretty preppy. So there was no metal head. You had, you had some hippies, you had mostly jocks, mostly higher upper echelon people, if you will. I was kind of an outcast. I just, I was out of shape, big fat kid. I just like metal and I like drumming and I didn't know many people. I used to see this guy walk around in a cannibal corp shirt. And I'm like, I got to talk to this guy. He loves metal. Anybody that wears a butchered, uh, I'm sorry, um, a, a tomb and a mutilated shirt in high school. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a move. That's right. a move, dude. Oh, back it, then. Yeah. It's a huge it, move. It was acceptable. Nobody questioned him. Nobody said anything. It was kind of crazy because guys understand 
I grew up in, in Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, which is still the highest tax tax bracketed area. So Providence High School, man, was a big deal. Like that was you had boosters and people that injected a lot of money into that school. So you didn't see people wearing some shit getting getting rummed out by some like a dead chicken and rummed out by some dude, you know, like you <laughs> wore, you wore shirts like that in school. Mm-hmm. So I went up to this guy and I said, Hey man, you know, you like death metal, right? He's like, Yeah. And that was it. That was it. I said, what do you play? He's like, dude, I play guitar. I got a BC Rich Warlock. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is oh, back then. Yeah, that's the oh, shit. Dude. He had one of the original, the OG, the nice made BC Riches. Yeah. Bro, it was the ghost. It was the black, it was the black to fade ghost paint job. Yep. I, I wish I still want to slap him. He got rid I told him when I went to the last recording session, like, why did you get rid of that guitar? It was amazing. Um, and I was we we started the band. Um and uh, I had another guitarist too, who's Tim, and he was like, he was like an Inve Malmsteen guy. He couldn't play like him, but he was the kind of guy like he would never play the solo the same way. He would just go nuts. He just had fast fingers. Couldn't carry a tune in a bucket, but this dude <laughs> bucket. just had fast freaking fingers. So oh, yeah. him, him and I, and I'm sorry, I failed to mention that him and I jammed in tenth grade for a lot. Him, it was just him and I. Um, and then I met Mike and then Mike started coming in. Then my, then that guy started kind of getting like, Hey, this guy's kind of impeding on my territory. Cause this guy's really talented. You, it was kind of a, it was kind of one of those. Mm-hmm. I played rec basketball and then go figure. I met my bases. The kid had long hair. So all of a sudden I assume he likes metal. Right. Mm-hmm. I go up to him. I say, Hey man, you, you know, you, you play metal. He's like, Oh dude, I love metal. You know, when we were talking about bands, I'm like, all right. I said, what do you play? He's like bass. I'm like, you want to try from a van? He was like, absolutely. Well, there you go. All of a sudden I had a four piece band. It was great. Mm. So that was Morpheus. The name of the band was Morpheus. It's kind of a rip off of Morpheus descends. Mm-hmm. Um, but we like the name Morpheus. We started that. We started playing, practicing, coming up with some songs. What year is this? This will be, um, so that would be I graduated in 97, so 95. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. 94, 95. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is a this is a minute ago. But it was cool, man. Like it was cool to see, you know, like when you guys start playing in the band and it's like, all right, we know that we're not great, but man, this is really starting to come together. We are actually playing a three and a half minute long song. Right. And it's got structure. There's a little bit of hook, maybe, but something's going on right. You know what I mean? Right. Um, yeah. So we started doing that. Well, basically, um, the guitarist gave me an ultimatum one day. I'm going to I'm going to a direction, but I want you guys to know all the details. Um, basically, the the lead guitarist called me one day. He said, "Hey, it's either the, it's either Mike or it's me." Well, I said, "Well, it's going to be you. You're gone because you suck." <laughs> and that's what it was. I was pretty brutal when I was young. I was, I was a guy you guys yeah. were, you, you would have not wanted to be my friend back in the day. <laughs> um, and basically, honestly, that's when that moment in like the end of 10th grade going to 11th, dude, we freaking stepped it up. We became carcinogenic. Um, and we were writing really good death metal songs for what it was like. It was legit. Like we were invited to battle little bands. We got second place. We lost to a band. that was more like a, this is the end thing. Now they were a good band. They were really tight, but yeah. we do. We were freaking killing it, man. We were opening up for Nile. Like, dude, we were, <laughs> we were yeah, doing some cool stuff. Like, dude, I, I, I texted Pete Amora today. I said, the greatest memory is when me, we used to geek out watching him warm up before mm. Nile set. Oh my gosh. It was the greatest thing ever. Awesome. That's sick. It really was, man. He used to have his snare drum. He'd have a shirt over it. And this guy would be doing rudiments and he'd go on stage. It was, dude, there was nobody. This is Pete from Nile. Pete Hamarua, is that his last name? Pete Hamora. Yeah. Hamora, yeah. On, on the first Nile album, which is like incredible. Nefronka, yeah. Dude, I'm going to tell you. Come, dude. That guy, there are stories for days about that guy. And I got to know him a little bit at a young age. And he recorded at the same studio for multiple albums that he recorded at. That guy was a freak. I mean, he would have tabs of his drumming and be able to play to them. Yeah. All that stuff in that yeah. And the guy that recorded all of Lost to Decay stuff and some of my albums, he says, Jordan, there was never a drummer in my studio like him. Nobody. Wow. He would crush everything tight from first note to the end and almost play it perfectly. Wow. 
So not to get off on it, but it was just I just wanted to give that guy some props because he's oh, so yeah, dude. Oh, yeah. Well, so so Niall or Greenville, South Carolina, yeah. is that the town? Yeah. Okay. And so you're North Carolina. How far away from Niall? Two hours. Two hours. Two hours and change. And the reason I know that is because you know we're gonna not I'm not gonna fast forward too much on you guys, but. I actually got to play for Nile one time in a fest with ten thousand people, and that was the most. Whoa, cool! Yeah, cool. we have to. How many people know about that? About me? I saw yeah. you comment about it about a month or two ago, and so I've only known for a little while. But I didn't know most at all. Dude. Didn't know. I, honestly, it's my fault. I I was never, and I, I don't want to say this time I'm popping my collar like I'm some big I honestly, I never was one. I I played with aggression, and I let you know I was freaking there. Period. You knew that Jordan Varela was on stage. There was no doubt about that. When I, and I'll, I'm very bold about that because my style was unique. How I and I put the work into it, so I made sure that people knew this fool's on stage. You're going to know who he is. But I wasn't one to gloat and brag about it online and stuff like that. I never told people about this, and not many people knew. You know, um, so a lot of times people say Jordan's an underrated drummer, and I can appreciate that. And you know whose fault that is? It's my fault because I wasn't a touring drummer. I didn't, you know, I didn't do a lot of social media stuff, not until recently, not until what, five years ago, mm -hmm. you know, posting videos and, and just conversing with you guys and getting to know people. So yeah, that was, that was the most amazing, but the most stressful moment in musical history for me. Playing how did that stuff. come about? How did that come about? How did, like, what was the, sure. uh, I, I can tell you the whole backstory on that. Cool. Yeah, let's do it. So, and, and you know what's cool? It was cool because I was upstairs. I was warming up, warming up on my as I play my drums early in the morning. My wife and son go to work. I would I play early. I'm a morning guy, so I play my drums at seven in the morning. Nice. So yeah, it's great, man. I'm out in the country. Name, name, I by the way, I, I enjoy yeah. watching your videos that you post, dude. Where you're wearing the fucking Bane mask and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mask. I am. Uh, I'm. A, my wife's like, "What is wrong with you?" I'm like, "Baby, just, just." It is what it is. Just <laughs> no, dude. Yeah, I think that's a thing. great tactic. That's no different than being a fighter that trains with one of those on, you know, to give themselves the advantage when they don't have it on. Well, you remember, so you, I, you know, and again, we'll keep this in context. But you, met Sean Shirk, he was an amazing UFC fighter. He had, mm -hmm. he has, uh, I think, he owns a big portion of that company. He was the one that came up with that idea to help really work his lungs. So I started that, dude. I've been training with an elevation mask for years. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You I, can tell I, with your endurance, dude. Oh, my gosh, bro. Like, I'm a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, and I train martial arts a very large part of my life. So I use that to help. Like, I was never the most talented, but I can tell you something right now. I was going to let people know you weren't going to outwork me. My yeah, cardio yeah. is going to be my cardio is going to be out outstanding. That's the most yeah. impressive with a lot of the UFC fighters nowadays is, like, the, the cardio people. That's, like, because nowadays you have the people to knock out, like, get them done in the first, second round. It's, like... Once you have those championship fights where you go to the fifth round, you'll see them yeah. go like, oh, fuck. I'm like, like, and then you see people that are just like, whatever, dude, I'm still fresh. Fuck you. And I'm like, that's You're great. Fun. Let's go. Yeah. I want to go three more rounds. Cool. Let's do sudden death. Exactly. Yeah, these, these exactly. Boys. And a lot of that stuff. And the reason that I, I, I was like, you know, I was upstairs one day and we'll get back on the Nile in a second here, but there, I was upstairs one day because people ask me like, why do you wear that? I'm like, you know, I do cardio six days a week. I train weights in cardio six days a week. Right. And I'm like, well, I wear the mask when I'm training. I'm like, dude, get in the drum room and freaking wear. You want to be a good drummer? You want to? Oh have wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, dude, it's in the middle of summer, and bro, I'm in the Carolinas, so it's Jesus. It's freaking in 98 degrees out here. I'm talking 60 percent humidity. I'm humidity, in my drum yeah, room. yeah. No AC. Jesus. And I got a sweatsuit on, and I vomited a few times. <laughs> it's okay. In, in the mask, you know. In the mask. Know. It's my bowl, <laughs> my shirt. I can't tell you how many shirts I soiled. <laughs> but but I'll tell you, man, honestly, you know, and I will say, all joking aside, I had to. There was a couple times this year with, when it got hot. I'm like, all right, JV, you you play for 35, 40 minutes, take the mask off. Now you're going you're gonna to suffer for yourself. You got to know when to call it, but I they're gonna say there's been four or five times where I went to the hospital, but you know, yeah. like it wasn't that big of a <laughs> I almost day. died. I was I was resurrected. <laughs> but, no, yeah. but no, honestly, it's it's funny. Um, who's the drummer, the guy that just played with uh Vile? Uh, Samuel Axelrad? He says, dude, great tip. I've been training with the elevation mask playing drums. I'm like, that's yeah, a win. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I think that's definitely move. it's a yeah. hack, dude. I mean, that's that's a like, win. yeah. yeah. I would so, think that obviously that would benefit for any live situation too, because that's you're going to be taking an extra air 
with the adrenaline rush and all that so your body there's always be... a, yeah there's always a difference between like playing in your jam room and practicing and then like when you're on stage like it's like i remember like before tour i would do this stupid thing and uh, actually i do i do kind of i do it now but way better but it's still silly and i shouldn't tell anyone but um i would be uh i would list basically take showers just in a squatting position <laughs> <laughs> because because my 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 like thighs like i'll play the first show and i'd be like dude i'm gonna my i'm almost like doing leg day like all of a sudden like yeah. i'm doing more than way more than i thought because in practice i'm not there's no one to perform to so i would be like oh. be, i know i know <laughs> anthony would no i see that. it's funny it's funny but, it, but for you it's a ritual thing I'm just, i can it's see really you in the shower fun. right now dude don't see me in the shower like, brother. Flicking, you're like flicking your balls because they're the things that are hanging because you're in the squat sumo style we no, should have had this conversation with with him on three beers then it would really be great <laughs> <laughs> what i'm saying nowadays is like a, a, my life hack now it's just not even a life hack but i do the same thing but I, i'll just do like 20 squats in the shower just just That's by yourself hey hey just wherever do it. You every, every shower you take that's my that's my thing i I, now, I encourage you know? any kind of uh body weight shit just to 10 seconds just fucking yeah, dude, do it, i'm just you know? i i gotta i gotta do something like that every day because of my job you know but it just the fact of like staying limber <laughs> don't, <laughs> just, see, don't see me in the shower brother <laughs> well, joseph remember remember we were yeah oh what's yeah, i got the the ankle weights here that i bought oh, to try okay. the gene hoagley uh, trick yeah you throw okay. on your ankles while you because he wears boots right so i guess it's kind of like preparing for the boots yeah well remember I, we remember when we played the fest right the fest it was in illinois and that was a that was actually like we couldn't have picked a better weekend because it wasn't hot it was actually really perfect weather it was sunny it was cool it was, it was i was surprised it was beautiful but mm -hmm. man that stage was freaking hot Oh yeah, and we didn't even have a full. I mean, it wasn't full capacity. Next year is gonna be full. Wait, till you guys see the lineup for the next year. Oh my gosh, I can't. I'll, say I'll, I'll fucking go. I'll go. Tell Miguel, it's, yeah. it's it's gonna be unbelievable. It's gonna be, in my opinion, the lineup. If, if everybody doesn't chip out, it's gonna be one of the best death metal lineups you've seen in a long time. No, if anyone doesn't, are you talking about domination? Yeah, Miguel, <laughs> Miguel is setting the bar, dude. He is. Yeah. He's really. He is a such. A freaking professional person. What venue in Chicago was it at? Uh, it was uh um oh my gosh the, the, the Brower House Brower House. Oh okay yeah I've heard in of, Lom Lombard Illinois I believe Lombard no, Illinois not, that's maybe. right okay. yeah like, Lombard Illinois and dude that's that that venue in my opinion was I played a lot of fests and that was the best venue I ever played it was it was narrow but it was somewhat wide but you could fit a lot of people and it wasn't brutally boldly hot in there. But that yeah. elevation mask, dude, I was up there. I was like, that's yeah. awesome, man. That's smart. I mean, Very I know that smart. there's been times. I remember uh, Suffocation, we did a tour with them. And I remember there was one place. I want to say it was North Carolina. I think it was Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Hot. So, yeah. And it literally, the AC broke and everything. And I think on stage, someone measured it. It was like 102 degrees on stage mm -hmm. or something. And we were like, I was playing like just bass and just being like, I'm going to maybe like pass out like i was like we had a bunch of water on stage we we're like dumping each other with water and stuff it was a fucking test and, and if i had the mask you know and like was practicing before i probably wouldn't be as close to passing out as i was it was like after two songs i'm like this is actually worrisome my vision is getting blurry and shit and i'm like whoa i feel like actual effects happening where it's like all right this is right before pass out like i'm almost I don't like yeah. heat, dude in clubs oh it's yeah in miserable man totally it's miserable and you got so many clubs and i get it these guys ain't making money but gosh knows dude like let's be real here like you gotta put some ac in that place you gotta you gotta keep these guys somewhat yeah i know i know out, man you know we were warned i mean it, it just it just had failed so we were like all right it's summer it's like fucking july or august and it's like <laughs> it's the worst yeah, it's, month ever i know and it's usually like really I forget the venue. You've probably been there before, but it's in Raleigh. Um, I don't know. It's it's like kind of uh, I played there with Cepho a few times, but and Whitechapel we were there. But um, yeah, no, it's like a fucking garage kind of thing. So it's like there's no insulation on it. So you really yeah. have to have you really have to have fucking yeah, you know, something going, or else it's literally in the hundreds in there. It's like yeah, it's, it's pretty brutal. So I, that actually brings me to another question that I had for you, Jordan. And I know sure. we're, we're off into the weeds right now, but with those videos, I also noticed that you have like a 
clean air duct coming into the room. Never use it. Oh, but I was going to say, like, is that your your way of getting fresh air into the room while you're playing? The kicker is the reason that I had that is because at the time, see, my upstairs is like 1,400 square foot. It's unfinished. So eventually I'm going to have to get it finished. So I, the Heaven Hammer Den, that's my studio, is a 12 by seven and a half, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, it's soundproof to the nth degree. I can go up there, blast beat for hours, and my wife can sit downstairs and watch TV, and she's not bothered. That's right. That's right. And my wife let me know if something sucks. So yeah. if you don't mind me asking, how much does it cost to get a room done like that? That's your laugh. It wasn't bad, man. So now, granted, we have to factor in. This is a couple of years ago when I did it. So materials now are double price. You did it yourself. Did it myself. Okay. The room is a skeleton. One of my one of our close friends from church, her husband's like a like he's like a he's a MacGyver guy. He could take gum and make a bomb out of it. So basically, we 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 drew out the plans. We got sheetrock. We just, you know, I, I, I only thing I wish I could do over was just the the rock, the rock insulation. I didn't think about that, but I used insulation. We did two ply of insulation inside. Uh, I'm sorry, two ply of drywall inside, one ply on the outside, insulation in the middle, and we did it in the ceiling. And what I did too, so you know the spray insulation foam, dude. I hit every crack. Yeah. 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 There was not one crack not done. I'm talking every crack. That OCD. We get it done. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then I got, um, you know, the mats in the gym. I got the special mats. I got them from a gym place. We put them on the floor for help with um, the help from vibration. Carpet on top. Mm. Do that room. And I have just a window. I play at six in the morning. Nobody's come. No cops have come to my house. It's been great. It sounds comfy to walk around in that room too. 850. 850 900 bucks damn okay wow that could be yeah that's like a i mean i don't know if it'd be a solid business for making money but that would be like a cool like a venture to be a company that helps you soundproof a room mm -hmm. so you could play sure. loud music sure in it or something because people yeah, will yeah. pay like you know a monthly a fee to their storage facility that will actually allow it because a lot of them don't and right. so, like, when I every month, buy my house, four hundred bucks a month. It's like, you know, that's a lot of money you put a year towards. That. I'm so gonna be like, doing that. What Jordan just mentioned, I'm gonna be as of right now making one <laughs> room my podcast music room, dude. Yep, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. A little For, I mean, because you're situation. moving out of the moving out of the hellhole, so you're getting well, actually uh, more room. It's what yeah. you said, like the AC thing. The reason I had the AC up there is number one, it's hot as balls outside. So, like, yeah, if I'm upstairs. And I'm doing guitar tracking or I'm doing any vocal stuff, whatever. I've got to have some airflow in the room that's proper. I have to be able, like, I mixed my third album. I was mixing even in the morning, the humidity is brutal. So, I'm like, I got to have some AC and I got a lot of equipment up there. Like, I can't have this stuff go bad. Yeah, maybe. that's another thing, too. Yeah. Now, now we have my, now my workroom where my office is my job. I have my studio downstairs now. So I got all my stuff. So now I can do my tracking for guitars, bass. And I can do, I'll do my vocals in the Heaven Hammer Denner because those are allowed. Nobody wants to hear, you know, nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> my drumming, I can do upstairs now, but I can do the, I can just bring my, my console and all that upstairs. It's quick, easy. Get that done. Come downstairs. Boom. Everything's plugged up. So, but it, but I've used it two or three times because the heat got so brutal. There was a couple of times where I was sweating profusely. I'm like, okay, I'm going to kill myself. So now it's time to turn the freaking air on. You right. know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's your detailed answer on that. That's Balloon cool, man. Stuff. I, I wanted well, to hear all of that. With all the got, money you save too, of worry, man. Yeah, yeah. I got with all the money you save too, you could have, you could save that money and put it towards like uh, things for your equipment, like uh, voltage regulators. Because I know that I'm living up in the kind of mountains ish place. Nice. And you can see right right here, my voltage yeah. is like at 10, it's at 112 right now, which is pretty high for it. It's supposed to be at 120, but I've seen it at 104, and I'm like, uh, and I'm like, why is my uh, power amp dying all the time? It's like it's so underpowered that it's blowing up and shit. So it's like when you have anything like tube related or like nice equipment, you want like a regular 120 volts going to it, or else you could you'll be sending that shit in for warranty. If it's not a warranty, you got to buy a new one and get it repaired. And yeah, well, Joseph. Oh, yeah. So I just know from talking to Chris and Justin from the Zenith Passage that Justin couldn't actually record guitars at his home because he had power issues at home. So he ended up mm -hmm. like going anywhere he could to just track guitars at somewhere that had regular power. And this is the first yeah. time I've ever even considered that that would be a thing. That is the first it time I've ever heard Isn't that crazy how that works? You don't think about that. 
when you yeah. when you when you start to do a, a, a do it yourself investment, it's a wonderful thing. You, I mean, we like we were just talking about Gilbert doing guitars at this freaking house. Yeah, yeah. It's not like he recorded them at, at, at with freaking David Turo. Like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, right. You know? But what, what I had to do, and I'm very blessed. My wife's father is a he was an electrician, electrician salesman, oh, and he nice. also taught electricity. So here's a great thing. He knows a lot of guys. He was owed a favor. Dudes came in. I have my own power outlet. So oh, I'm up on our yeah. switch. Yeah, bro. So my heaven hammer den upstairs, it's got its own outlet. So I can plug my ceramic heater for the winter, whatever it may be, plug in my studio gear. No, nothing. No, yeah. outs, no, nothing. It's amazing uh, how much actually one thing that a lot of people don't know and me working in the industry I'm working in and, and those little fucking space heaters, those things fuck up things so like if they're this big and they're fifteen dollars at walmart those things pull like fifteen hundred to two thousand volt or yeah, watts or yeah. like out of it and it i've is, had yeah. so many times where it's like oh we're out of power at this office i'm like what the fuck like how and i go over there and like yeah we all have space heaters running like you can't do that like we have <laughs> yeah. a thermostat over there like turn it up because it literally sucks i've when i first moved into into here i turned my uh little tiny space heater that i have up there to to full power and it just went bam, and just took out the whole fucking house well <laughs> like most of the time like, those yeah. things are used in spaces that that are way bigger than they actually can heat so they're just yeah. constantly trying to heat with no threshold then yeah exactly you know right yeah same uh, yeah if you so i have to keep them on one i have to keep them on the lowest setting if i want to have them on it was a breaker <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. No, no. Seriously, like, there's been yeah. times where when I first moved in, I'm like the power's out just in my room, and Trevor's like, "Sick, dude. Like, what were you doing?" <laughs> I'm just like, it'll, uh, it'll, be, it'll be like 18 degrees outside, so like, I'm nuts, man. Like, I'll play my drums and then I work out after. So I'll do, I'll yeah, do yeah. cardio, and my wife will be blow drying her hair, and then all of a sudden the entire blow house dryer, power too. goes out. I'm like, we we'll have to text each other. Hey, let me know when the blow dryer is going on. Yeah, yeah. Me. Because the blow dryer, you notice, I'm, as a kid, I always noticed, like, when my mom would use it or whatever, it would just, the whole, the lights would dim. Like, yeah. everything would dim when the blow dryer went on, you know? It's, like, same technology. It's just, like, a fucking toaster, you know, in there. And That's just, like, that true, sucks man. so much energy. Anyways. No. If, has, so, yeah. if we, um, say, so if we go back, right, and look like, we're talking about 10th grade musicians coming up, I started playing with the guy in 10th grade. Mike in Epic of Imperia, my bassist Chris Curley. We had a legit, actually, you could actually look it up on YouTube. The music is there to listen. It's called Epic of Imperia. When you get a chance, check it out. It was death black, uh, death, like black and death metal. Guys, I go back and listen to this, and I I I don't say this sounding like I'm like I'm some Billy Bad Boy. I'm like, dude, that was really freaking good metal. Like, I'm like, I would put that up to and if it was done in a Mac Daddy studio. There's no way it wouldn't have gone on season and missed or some of these other compliments. I'm like, it was that good. And I'm like, I can't believe we were actually doing metal that good. So I'm like, okay, I've got some special guys here with me. Mm -hmm. And basically, as we're going to get this Nile story kind of from this, how it transcended into Lust of Decay and stuff. So basically, with Epic of Imperium, we did that through high school, through college, um, yeah, and when I started college, we were real hot and heavy. We were playing, you know, trying to do some fest and playing shows, went out of town to play shows. We recorded the folder that I was telling you guys about. Um, and it was just, it was a three-piece. Chris Curley, the guy that was doing bass at the time, he got more into hardcore. He left. He kind of went off and did his own thing. We wound up getting my buddy Adam Schroeder. This guy is a freaking shredder. Hmm. He played a fretless bass with us, and this guy on stage would windmill. I mean, we just windmill, and I'm talking playing a fretless bass. I've never seen nothing like it. So <laughs> that's sick. Yeah, he this he, he really was an animal. And my stepmother even she came to watch us play one time, and she knew nothing about music. She said, "Jordan, that bassist dude, he's a freaking animal. Like, yeah, he's he's pretty scary." So it was cool in the mm -hmm. to have some great musicians. Mm -hmm. So again, we kind of started doing that. We were writing more material, more material, really, really refining our product. We started getting into. I am really big into, I love atmospheric black metal death bands. That's kind of funny. People think I just listen to heavy. No, 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 no. I love atmospheric. I do too. Yeah. yeah. I'm very like, I, I'm into Kavist. I'm into more grinning. I'm into like awesome old school black metal bands that nobody knows anything about. Like, who's that? I'm like, dude, 
trust me go listen to them it's all cool yeah. that's another band that's like a style of music that's really cool to listen to like at work or something like something that where you're like you're doing stuff and like an atmospheric black metal band it's yeah. like it just works perfectly like if you're having to do like think a bunch and you don't want to listen to like something crazy and sure. like you want to be like in a vibe where it's like you're kind of I don't know, feeling the fucking the clouds roll in or a little bit. You know <laughs> well, dude, you listen to a CCP. Their earlier productions, Klaus, uh -huh. um, was it CPC or CCP? Klaus Prellinger was a guy out of, um, he had a label for a minute there, man. It was cool because he was a producer. So what he would do is he would sign these freaking great acts and he would record them in his home studio. So you look at um, Dornenreich. Dude, they mm -hmm. are great. Early Dorn and Reich. Now the new stuff I can't get into is too experimental. But the first, the earlier Dorn and Reich, hands down, some that's some of my biggest influences for Inconquered. You know, because nice. that guitarist was a freak. The way that he wrote and, and like, how do you even dream up some kind of a riff, contra riffs, and all the things that that guy's doing? So mm -hmm. coming up listening to those kinds of band, my guy Mike, my guitarist, really introduced me to so many cool black metal bands and. And then, like, all of a sudden, Viking metal became a thing, you know? And I'm hearing all these Moon Sorrow and all these amazing bands, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Moon Sorrow's freaking great. Super sick, um, yeah. Dude, that record, V Haveati, that one's so sick. Yeah, they're yeah. all their albums rip. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and then, like, and then, like, even like Theater of Tragedy and some of these other bands, even like the, the you know, when the women started coming more into the singing and everything, I got exposed to so many cool things when I was like, First, second year of college, man, the world just really opened. And then what really set me to the next level, there was two people that really opened my eyes to metal. I'm going to give them big credit on here. You, you call it plugs. Um, <laughs> a girl named Tammy Gillen. If you're not friends with her on Facebook, look her up. Tammy Gillen. She's out of Illinois. So remember back in the day when we had mag metal magazines, we didn't have internet. So we had to like write people. Right. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, you're looking for a pen pal, buddy. I have demos I want to share. So, you know, I was a young kid and I saw her and I'm like, wow, she's a good looking girl. Let me write her, you know, but it was cool because she actually said like, hey, I'm Illinois, Illinois metal. You know, I, I love all these bands. And I'm like, who's Jungle Rot? Who's Flesh Grind? Who, mm. all these bands that are amazing. Who's Gorgasm? Right. Really? Gorgasm? Come on, man. You know, but totally. nobody really knew much about him then. Right. So I wind up writing this girl. She winds up sending me a ridiculous packet of stuff. I open it up and all of a sudden I'm hearing Arctic Symphony. I'm hearing Flesh Grind. I'm hearing Jungle Rot, which is still within this day one of the best grooving death metal bands for old school stuff. Gorgasm, which absolutely just, come on, man. Like, they're a juggernaut of a band. Yeah, I called them my favorite band at one point. Absolutely. You know, Lesky and those boys are just Vikings on stage. It's scary watching them. And I'm sure Murdoch would say it still currently for him. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, Joseph, you, we, you were there, right? You saw him on stage. That was scary. Yeah, yeah it's fun scary. watching them, dude. You know, that was, I was like, I have to play after Gorgasm. Like, what the really? Fuck? I gotta live up to that. <laughs> you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, that was insane. I was just like, all it's, right, it's, it's voracious. <laughs> it's like it's 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 like a pit bull that doesn't let go when they bite something. It's just it's it's crazy. But and she, it, so, it, go ahead. I was I just was, gonna I was gonna do a really quick uh, side thing because. Uh, Severed had played with Gorgasm on a bloodletting back in, uh, I think Murray was saying in the chat, 03, and he made me, he just reminded me of that when they were in the bay, they put, they practiced at Severed studio, and I got to be a fly on the wall of a That's Gorgasm true. rehearsal alongside seeing them at the first and last show of that tour. But it was, you know, at the time, they were my favorite band to listen to and masticate to dominate was, had just come you out. Had the OG and, lineup. You had the OG lineup. Yeah, there. dude, both Tom's. Well, now he's Damien, but back then he was known as little Tom. It was big Tom and little Tom. Big Tom, little Tom yep. Yep. And, uh, and, and I just was enamored to be in the room, just watching my favorite band rehearse and, you know, even mess up. There was times where they train wrecked a song or two, and then they had to go back to the top. And I'm just like, yes, they're humans. It makes you feel human, right? It makes you, it's yeah, awesome. you know, it makes, you, it makes, makes you feel better about yourself when you fuck up because you're seeing these guys that you look up to fuck up as well, because we're all humans and we're just trying to duplicate some art that we've created live each that's another uh that's another unique thing about music in general and being in a band there's there's the art but then it's recreating it 
it's like right tell a painter to repaint their painting every night for 30 nights <laughs> in a row you know right. it, it would be fucking a big task for joe that kind man, of art joe a man crushing on gorgasm I, know, I was like, should I, I was like, should I post all these uh, Lesky Gorgasm things? Oh my god! Still talking about like, yeah, yeah. We're, me and Joseph were watching, and I was I standing next to you know Nate from Wounds, but like I say, he's one of my closest friends, and we were watching him, and we're just like, how? How? I mean, it was it, it's it's so we've all seen so many death metal bands. And all I forgot those... that Murray did that, dude. I, sorry, yeah, Murray, Murray that, played in Gorgasm. He, for he a while. toured with him, and I think it was in Europe, oh, right, Murdog. In 06, he filled in for bass on a full Did tour. Did he really? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome, dude. That's freaking cool, man. That's yes. 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 It was your up. Yes. <laughs> you should just say, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Murdoch saying, I don't. We got this girl Tani. This girl Tani, man, I, I really owe her. I, I I still, it's so cool, man. I hit her up years back and I said, hey, I, I sent her a message. I said, hey, look, if this is not a, you know, I'm a married man. I'm not trying to hit on you. I'm not, I'm, this is me saying, Thank you. And she was so blown away about it. She's like, that is so awesome. That made my day. Because, I mean, she really had such a huge impact. And I'll never forget that girl. And she's an amazing photographer, too. Like, her photography is ridiculous. So if you're ever in Illinois with a band or something, like, that's the chick to take pictures of your band. Um, okay. So her. And then one day my guitarist from Epic of Imperia said, hey, I have some buddies. I don't think you never met them. Do you know Trent? I'm like, oh, I don't know these guys. I never met them. He's like, well, hey, we're going to go over there and hang out. They're really cool dudes. So a guy named Trent McCall, he played with a black metal band called And Venom Thy Winds. Crazy, mm -hmm. crazy. Dude, we go over to meet these dudes, all long hair. I'm talking underground metal shirts, bands. I've I couldn't even read the shirts. I didn't even know what it was about. <laughs> Here I am, like, thinking Napalm Death's underground. You know what I mean? Yeah. So... I get over there. I met these guys. They're all awesome. They took me with open arms. Trent McCall, this guy, I still talked to him. I just talked to him the other day. Is one of the biggest musical influences to ever hit me. And he's like, hey, man, nice to meet you. See you, the drummer. I'd love to, love to see you play sometime. Well, dude, it was like, it was just like, it was crazy. We go in a house. And their drummer was there. The bassist, dude, they had a little setup. They had a band it's called Excreted Putridity crazy name you had to see the logo and this is before the crazy internet or nothing so I'm like these guys are almost handwriting church you know and i'm just like holy crap dude they were dude they were playing stuff that just i've never seen guys do their fingers and do all this stuff you know hit these are arpeggios and harmonics and the drummer was blasting and it was just the craziest thing so i'm like there's a whole different world of metal out here mm -hmm. so he pulls me in his room he's like yo you ever heard crypt tops i'm like who the hell's that He's like, no oh, 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 I, I got this. Dude, yeah, dude. I hear blasphemy made flesh, and I said, I quit. I'm done. That's really, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why a am I even holding drumsticks right now? <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm fucking being a dick right now, holding these drumsticks after that. Dude, <laughs> I think cryptopsy is cryptopsy is one of those. Cryptopia, cryptopia is uh, <laughs> one of those. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cryptopsy is one of those milestones for sure. Once you come mm -hmm. across it, that's that's like a level up right there when you're well, going to the, the game of death metal. Right. 100%. You think about this. So here I am thinking that Deicide and Napalm Death and all these bands are underground, right? I, I don't know much about anything at the moment. All of a sudden, I hear these Canadian freaks playing this music and i'm hearing this guy go doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah flow oh, style too yeah if you're following drummers your hands like, you come across you flow know? and it's something totally different dude and the groove was so and then all of a sudden you know yes. you know the, you know, you know the riff of the bass is beep 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 slaps the bass and i'm like yep flow's going nuts on the ride and i had doing all these cool syncopated beats and i'm like Dude, this is, I, I've got to hear more. And then this guy, Trent, this guy had already like 500 plus discs. So we're like all, not even 20 yet. Tapes galore, records. Dude, he was playing so much stuff, just underground stuff. In Satanity, I don't listen to that stuff anymore. But he was playing In Satanity and all these bands I've never heard of. Blood of Christ from Canada, all these bands. So he started making me demos after demos. I mean, like, you know, compilations of stuff. And, and at that time... That was it. So that's when I'm like, okay, 
we're going in the right direction. We're doing underground metal. We're playing shows. We're making recorders. We're doing stuff. And I need to become better as a drummer. So I started getting after it. I started practicing yeah. a lot. Started getting better gear. I got my my first double bass set was a Tama kit, an old. Mm -hmm. um, it was an old kit from like 1982. It had it had the fiberglass inlay with the mahogany shells and stuff. It was pretty sick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here's a freak. Um, but I got my first kit. Started growing. Started growing. Basically, what happened was. I didn't know how to, I'm getting to a funny story with this. I didn't know how to tune drums or the crap. I, I thought all drums sounded like bongos. So it was like, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> so, <laughs> duh, like duh, 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 duh. <laughs> so here we are playing shows, dude. I was, they're like, this kid is a young, this kid is freaking good. Like he's going to be the, like I had buddies of mine that used to say, Jordan, all the drummers from the local scene, we used to have local bands, seducer, punisher, um, just old school kind of like beer drinking metal bands, but they were solid bands and they were the, they were the bands at, at the time in the Carolinas in the nineties, you know, they would play, they'd get together and play poker and like this kid, Jordan, he's enough to become a drummer. So it was just cool to hear that. You know, I was a young punk, snot nose punk with a ship on my shoulder. So basically started getting better gear. We started writing better music and then we would play shows with a band called mind kill. Well, P.S. Mm -hmm. That's lost the decay. So it was oh, Jay, okay. Steve, it was Brent on drums, and it was uh, Rob McFarland. They called his nickname Junkie. And um, <laughs> we were it's playing. An early one. <laughs> oh, dude, we were playing with these guys, and it was the biggest. Like these boys are country, man. Like they thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And here I'm a Yankee, but I live in the Carolinas, and we were, you know, we were up and coming and playing shows with these guys, and we ran into them a couple times. Well, <laughs> the joke was like, you know, like. Jay would be like, man, that boy can play some drums, but this drum sound like trash. <laughs> it, sound like bong, it sound like bongos. <laughs> if you know Jay, Jay is country, dude, you know? Yeah. But uh, anyhow, basically what happened was um, I started, I started, I started, I kind of started falling out of it. Like I wanted to do more. Brent didn't work out Lust of Decay. I guess the story happened was they were getting ready to do their first full length, Lust of Decay was. So the artwork you see on the first, first Lust of Decay, that was actually the artwork that was going to come out. Yeah. Brent decided to do, and Brent's a dude, Brent's a, Brent's not a showboat drummer like me, but Brent is a solid freaking drummer. If you listen to Atrocious Abnormality and some of those albums, that dude killed it. He doesn't like me. Whatever. I don't really care, but Whatever, but he's. I always say the guy's an amazing drummer. Mm -hmm. What he decided to do, the story was that when they they weren't able to record at a time that he was able to record, so he would just play the drum tracks by ear, which we know is going to be a train wreck. You know, I don't think Troy was going to record drums for Savior Savior if he didn't have the guitar tracks in his ear. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, for sure. All his music was. I don't even know how he pulled that crap off. So I, I mean, I can let alone try to memorize that by ear. Yeah. P.S. They recorded this like on an eight track and everything. There was so many things that were off. And finally, Jay and Steve were like, dude, this isn't right. It's not it's not on. It's not going to work. And uh, basically, they said, look, you got to you got to do this over again. Brent said, I'm not doing it. And they said, OK, well, you're fired. You're done. You're not going to be the drummer anymore. That's it for you. And they're like, who's going to drum? And then they I think it was either it was either Steve or Jay. They reached out to me and they said, hey. Do we would love to we'd love to have you come on board. And I'm like, sure, let's do it. They sent me the mm -hmm. three song demo. Um uh three song demo. Learned the songs. They came down to the shed rice to practice. And do we we they were not used to they were not ready for the things that I was getting ready to do it was totally contradictory to the drumming that they were used to. But it was at the time, remember guys, I was listening to Pioneer this oh, yeah. fuck yeah. So my drumming was going in that direction. Right. He was my drum hero at the time. Mike Hamilton, that guy, you know, I had certain drummers that uh hi, dad. Stephen, what's I said, that? I said hi dad. <laughs> I call my death I call my death metal dad. So. Mike Hamilton. <laughs> I, I got, wait, side note, I held back from commenting today on the sick drummer shout out sick drummer magazine, sick drummer post with Mike Hamilton. I just was gonna post or comment, hey, that's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we're, on the same, we're on the same wavelength today, dude. All right. That's freaking Anyways. Awesome. Yeah, we love, so we love our dad. Oh, but Lost of the K, man. When they, they came down, we jammed, and it just did. It just clicked. And, you know, Steve, Steve, Steve's a good Steve's a really good dude. If you don't know Steve, he's just a he's just a great guy. And um, 
he was like, man, you know, it, it's tough letting go of a brother. I get you try to you have a little bit of loyalty there, you know, but he's like, you know, you know what? We got to progress, man. We have to move. And this guy's drumming like he's going to he's going to help propel us to the next level. And guys, remember when I say that at the time I was young, man, I was like 22, 23. I was angry. I was buffed. I was pissed off. I I was not the Christian man that I am today. I dude, I went up to Dave. Matri- <laughs> I went up to Dave Matrice at a show for Jungle Rock. I said, hey, man, you Dave Patrice and Jungle Rock? He's like, yeah, nice to meet you. You know what I'm here to do tonight? He's like, what? I'm here to make all your drummers look stupid. <laughs> Drop the mic. <laughs> I walked off. That's what I said. Mm-hmm. And Jake's like, you effing idiot, blah, blah, blah. Like, I said, Jake, but that's what, but I was such a schmuck. I really was. Yeah. I, was I was not a nice guy. I was very militant. Um, and because I grew up in a really tough house. What was that from, you think? I think it was from the a lot the of drill sergeant. A lot of daddy issues, a lot of daddy issues, a lot of anger. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I, I was a good drummer. I, I was coming up. I was up and coming up. It was getting to my head. Um, and I knew that I would perform. And I knew that if I was up on stage at Lust of Decay, woe to the band that came on after us. Mm-hmm. That was my mentality. You know, guys used to go up to Jay and be like, dude, what's wrong? Dude, your drummer, he's freaking animal. But what? why does he have such an attitude? Jay's like, you want him to play good? You shut the hell up and leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to have the attitude. You need to have the like. He me, man. Yeah, but yeah. it wasn't right. You know, it wasn't right. But I was such mm. a young. I was, dude. We. I know, dude. We all look back at ourselves in our early twenties up till, you know, 25, 26, 27. Where, just you know, yeah. Do wrong. I'm the man. That, that's you the know? flaw. That that is the flaw of being a, a a guy is the that type of our that part of our life that we're always going to look back and be like ah oh, like you're, you're a fucking idiot when you yeah, like, yeah. acted like this and this and that but you take those as life lessons and absolutely you and so jordan actually and- one one thing that's i mean obviously we've you know coming into this podcast i you know we've we've known each other for a little while but like uh i wanted to know about like so you're talking about your you know being a young kid and being this shit and 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 talking about you know like you you're talking about your faith a bunch on here which i you know i didn't it's very rare we'll be just be honest it's like it's like alex bent maybe is another per- trivium is the only other. such a great mm-hmm. guy yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's like um and i've heard you mention it. so how so that's like you being in a gnarly death metal band sure. and having that you know which is not very accepted even though it's it, 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 people don't really care as much anymore but right. obviously back in the day that was like a big deal like how yeah. did that? So was it a certain time in your life where it was like, all right, I'm off the rails, or like, what's going on? Yeah, and I, well, we, okay. that's good. Well, so check this out. So basically, because I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll timeline everything for you. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean. No, to you're good. Out. You're good. No, I'm um, because yeah. honestly, I'm the kind of guy like I, I said. I told my wife, said I'm gonna wear these dudes out because I'm a detailed guy. Like I'm the kind <laughs> of guy. I love, love it. People, you want to know, like I'm the kind of guy. I want to know the details. Give me totally. all the details because I want to know the D, the DNA of the situation. You know yeah. what I mean? I should have mm-hmm. been a freaking, I was probably a lawyer in my past life. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but no, like um, to what we were saying, basically I was a Christian. I started, I, I became a saved Christian when I was in 11th grade, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, mm-hmm. And how that came about, because this is, this is actually a good time. Like, cause it was, it was just a little bit before I, I joined Lust of the Cave. But in 11th grade, my mother and my stepfather at the time when they were married, they were they were not meant to be together. They were just terrible. But all of a sudden, I used to visit every summer in high school for a couple of weeks to see them. And that house was peaceful. It was unbelievable. It was it was beautiful. We prayed. They prayed at the table like it was. But it was it wasn't it wasn't scripted, guys. Like it was it was yeah. wholesome. It felt good. It was nice. And even my younger brother, he's a baby. I was a teenager. He was a baby. But the way the house was set, it was just a beautiful thing. I'm like, whatever's going on here, I need that in my life. So I accepted right. Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was in 11th grade. But the problem was is that I didn't have the guidance and the people like my father. We won't even get into that story. My father and my stepmother, like, you know, there wasn't talk about God in my house. So I didn't really have I didn't have extra guidance to help me along in my young ages. Hey. Let's do this. Let's go to study. Let's go to church, whatever. I didn't have that. So I just kind of, I floundered for years, not really understanding what that meant. Mm-hmm. So just that, that's kind of that start of that for you. So basically joined Lust of Decay and um, we, we, uh, we started, do we put out that three song demo and we went to 
the not the 9 to 9 to 9 Ohio Death Fest was the death biggest death best death metal fest ever known to man mm-hmm. ever the wow. environment to humanize all the bands that started getting trajectory mm-hmm. every band was there it was the scariest fest you've ever seen oh yeah so i think it was either the 2000 oh i'm sorry i think i joined lust of decay what 2001 2002 so it was okay. one of those ohio fest and we were next to sapergenic so those guys were untouchable when did infesting come out so infesting i'll tell you right now hold on infesting so this was before or after Infesting the exhumed. Hold on one sec. I'll tell you. I'll look up metal archives. Really is a beautiful. I am. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's, that's usually. Professor. I'm so bad at years, names, and years. I can never remember this stuff. I can no, see August, that. August 2002. There you 2000, go. There you go. 2002. Yeah. So. I could see the professor was enjoying that type of going like, a little too much. So yeah. it had to have been 2000. It was probably early 2003. It was at, there was an Ohio Fest, which was ran by Brian Baxter, I believe, at the time. You know, and um, do you had Sean Whitaker, man, with Insidious Discrepancy. Oh, yeah. They first came out like, dude, I mean, come on, man. I got so to sick. see so totally. many, Dude, I got to see George Torres play for Skinless. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, dude. And shout out so to, uh, real quick, we got Chris Mahara in the chat, which is so, one of our, one of my uh, awesome. bros. Yeah, no. Side note. Eight. Remember yeah, that? EP? Skinless drummer, by the way, in the chat. <laughs> oh what up dude yeah. sorry i was just on the <laughs> george torres thing love you brother uh no i was just gonna re- mention that ep that george torres is on dude i i was excited to get that ep when skinless came through but now it's actually like a rare item there's one little skinless ep i think five songs or something really only three songs and like two instrumentals or something like that he was unstoppable I'm up to two metal archives tabs right now. <laughs> double tabbing. <laughs> Got to double tab this shit. Yeah, he, yeah was, you know, whatever the one that the uh, long stress miscreant. Was. Yeah, there you go. There it is miscreant EP. Yep, it was one of those Torres on drums. Slim. Uh, Bada bing. It was one yep. of those little slim. Uh, it was looked like a single, but it was an EP. Great yeah, drumming. Yeah. That dude's awesome. Dehumanized so is- rules. Ohio Death Fest 2003, we're thinking. You guys are really, yep, yep. I'd love okay. to talk to George in the future, too. No doubt. Dude, that would be freaking great. Yeah. Because dude. I don't care what anybody says. That guy was unstoppable. He was unstoppable. He was great, dude. And and those later dehum- dehumanized records, too, he's really showing how he can play, dude. dude prophecies foretold? Yeah, even yeah, but I'm saying even further along along the dehumanized timeline, he was even he was unstoppable at the end of that. Uh, is he do? Did he do anything after dehumanized? No, he stopped. He just he, really he on Facebook. He stopped playing. Well, I'd still love to talk to him, dude. George was a rad dude when I hung out with him. So yeah, I, I, I yeah he 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 does, he does slam some drums, man. I miss. I, I really do miss that guy. Like I, I looked. You gotta you remember something. He was a huge influence to me. Coming Hell up, yeah. there was a few drummers. A drummer for Disavowed, him, um, Hamilton, yeah, you know, Tyson Jupin when Depopulate came out. There yeah, were certain yeah. drummers, man. Like Tyson Jupin was unstoppable, man. Like I mean, that guy totally. was a freaking animal. You know, what's up with the Blast Fam? Raph we'll keep wanting to talk about the how Anthrax sucks ass. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that he was going to come on here. I think, plantain. yeah, plantain. Plantain. I, time. Yeah, yeah. Tell him he loves plantains when you talk, and that's plantain, man. He loves plantains. <laughs> 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 love, we give each other so much grief. I absolutely love that man. He is the best. Okay. He's the yeah, best. I had a feeling it was like an inside joke. I was like, okay. I mean, I mean, I'm not a big Anthrax fan either. Um, actually, <laughs> shout out to Pat Kenny. I mean, I don't, I don't hate him or anything, but we were watching Anthrax together. It was me, Risha, and Pat Kenny. And Pat Kenny goes like, Pat Kenny's not down. Obviously, he's not into it at all. <laughs> he, whispers, he whispers into my. Uh, it's Dan Kenny's little brother um, from uh, Suicide Silence. But like, he like whispers in my ear. He goes like. I don't know what's worth about worse about this band, like seeing them live or getting it in the mail. <laughs> Anthrax. <laughs> Dude, I mess with rap all the time. I'll send him. I'll just out of nowhere. I'll send him raps. Hey, he I, all I gotta say, finger, he sends me back a middle finger. <laughs> this, my thing is this: mad respect, Scotty. <laughs> mad respect, Scotty. Like, oh, eats it in front of his bros, like his plantains. 
I'm just kidding. Yeah. Oh my gosh, you mad respect, <laughs> Scotty Ian. Mad respect, uh, Danny Loker. Charlie oh, Benante is that. doing the whole uh, dude. Shout out to our pa- past uh, guest, guest, guest member, um, Derek. Derek. He's playing in fucking Pantera right now. <laughs> That's That's sick. A, he's my, I mean, I've been, I've lived on that guy on a, with a, on like through Europe on a bus. Like, it's crazy just seeing him up there with like Phil and Zach Wild not That's really cool, doing the man. solos at all, right? But um, it's uh, <laughs> it's really cool to see them. Like really, I mean, and fucking Charlie to me is probably the most impressive part of that band. Do you I'm think like, Zach Wild is doing it to just make it his own, or is it because he really can't so do let it? Me, let me say this. Bag solo. Let me say this. Can't do I went to go see Black Black Label. Now yeah. I'm not a fan. Yeah. A buddy of mine I used to work with, this guy named Josh. He loved. He was a black metal, a Black Label fanatic. Yeah. I was like, you know what? Zach Wild's great. So I'm like, you know, it's an outdoor show. It was like an hour from the house. Let's go check it out. Mm-hmm. We loved Dimebag Darrow. Like they were very yeah, close. Yeah. So oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I, I believe I, I, I'm going to be, first of all, let's be politically correct. Zach Wild has money. He don't need money. He made yeah, yeah. plenty of money off of Ozzy Osbourne. Believe totally. that. Right. Totally. Right. Plenty of money. So Christmas is not rough at their house. Mm-hmm. Black <laughs> Label, he's done okay for himself too. And they did all that stuff a lot on their own. Right. Yep. So, I think they could have paid him farva beans, and I think he would have played. Right yeah. for free, we've done it. Yeah, I think for what he's doing, I got to watch. I got to really sit down and analyze what they were doing, and I, I believe me too. Yeah, but what it is, I think it's great. I think no, I think it's cool. It's kind of like a. I, I like what he's doing as far as the fact that it's his best fucking friend, and he's up there just jamming, kind of like doing a Zach Wild version of it. Um, I don't think there's only there's only a two or three people I think in the world I've seen ever play guitar like Dimebag like on you know like everyone's doing things on youtube nowadays like oh these kids are on youtube are crazy there's only like wes howe which is another past member podcast person and um fuck uh fucking vog from decapitated those are the two people that i would say that like have touched dime bags like feel you know and um i know with um with ozzy like i saw zach with ozzy and i was like fucking so stoked i was like and then everyone's like, oh, he's doing too much pinch harmonics. And I'm like, I think it's fucking rad. It's like it's his touch on it. You know what I mean? But on um on just with the dime bag stuff, I was like, I heard I just watched the whole timeline. So the timeline was he was on um Ola England's podcast and he was like, Oh, I haven't even started like playing it yet, kind of like and it's like coming up. And then all of a sudden he's like, I'm watching YouTube videos to get ready for it. But I was like, he he wants to do his own thing on it. And for me, as a Pantera fan, like the solos are probably I don't know, 60% of why I'm like obsessed with that band, like probably 60%. So, so to take that part and do that for me personally, for him, he's showing a shout out to his brother and it's fucking, I love it. I love it. As the, as the sentimental part, I fucking absolutely. I'm like, that's fucking like he's shouting out to his brother, you know, all the, all the cool things. But like, I was like, ah, oh, man, like he like starts the solo. He does it right. Then he just goes into a Zach Wild thing. And I'm like, OK, we know what you can do, man. We, we get, <laughs> I get your still your skill set has been defined over you know the last three decades. I, I totally understand. But um, on I mean, Dimebag's my Jimi Hendrix. I think he's Jimi well, Hendrix for metal. Like, sure, like agree. there's it's like literally it's like Jimi Hendrix, Dimebag, Daryl. Like they're like in the same conversation. You know what I mean? Of just mm-hmm. people yeah. that would be I'd watch these like my challenge to people is like find a Dimebag Daryl video of them of Pantera playing live and try to find a fuck up like tr- like and he's yeah. wasted he's like completely wasted and he's doing he'll maybe do different things but he's doing it on purpose and like it's always been like Dimebag just doing his own thing and he's so fucking accurate while wasted <laughs> I don't yeah. understand that at all. Like I know, I know just, this would have get. I know this would have went against the grain. But in my opinion, I Joel, I agree with what you're saying because you know two two things I would say there. And what mm-hmm. I think they should have did. Let's thicken it up. You know what? Let's get a lead guitarist that's going to play exactly what he played. Yeah, that's what I want. And let's get Zach. Zach's an awesome can, can play. I mean, he's solid. Let's Super let him solid. play the rhythm. And I, I get it. People I want love that piece. Yeah. But how cool would it be? First of all, we know it's a reunion, right? Not a reunion, mm-hmm. but like a kind of like a re- reunite the band kind of thing. But um, what was I gonna? I was trying to go somewhere with that. But I, I think was, I'm hink- I'm thinking holographic dime bag doing the solo. <laughs> yeah, I'm more down with doing, that. Man. They were yeah. Ronnie right James Dio. Why can't they do it with him? But just yeah, imagine yeah. this, right? So think about this. We know that the aside, right? Children of the underworld. You know that. Yeah. Right. So imagine just saying me playing, 
that would not work. <laughs> People are like, what the hell is this guy doing? He's now playing Steven Shives' riffs. <laughs> yeah. Same concept. Even though Pantera was Mac Daddy It's just, the same thing as, you know, not to cut you up oh, real quick, but just, you know, Max from uh, Death to Us All or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. we had him on the pod, too. Like, watching him in do the death thing, I'm like, he is doing the, like, exact Chuck that yes, I want to see. Is. And, like, he's nailing it. Like, he's doing the solos. His voice is perfect. Like everything, it's like brought back this like feeling. I was like, whoa, like feeling like the super like nostalgia. Kid. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's insane. Freak. Yeah, yeah. So, Sorry, Murray. Beer back. Those kind of bands, Murray, beer back. You, those kind of bands, man, you've got, that's the thing. That's why I would never do well as a drummer in these bands. Like you have to, you have to play. You yeah. have to play what it is. Like people expect, like even like, like, like a Hoagland. People expect the bell and the, and, and the certain nuances. They want to hear that, not mm -hmm. my interpretation of what it is. People right. don't it's want to hear that. It's nostalgia. We don't want to see someone mis like interpret it like uh, uh, differently, right. especially when right after they announced, like there's that video that came out of Vinny going like, "Fuck no, it's not a fucking tribute." He's all, "You want?" He's, he said he's talking about Zach Wild. He's, ex I mean, he's all, "You want Zach Wild to jump in?" Like, no, it's fucking Dimebag. He's all. You want, and he said something kind of brutal. He was all, I have it on my Instagram where he's all, you want, um, Eddie Van Halen was alive at the time. He was like, you want Eddie Van Halen get shots four times in the head and have Zach Wild replace him and call it Van Halen? Like, that's what he said. And I was like, Ugh. like it was, that was the one thing that was holding that whole reunion was, was, that was, was like, that was my initial reaction too. It was like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I'm glad it's you. fun. It's a fun thing. I think it should be called Pantera Tribute or something and just have fun with it. Like, I don't think to call it Pantera is kind of like, I mean, I know, I know, Vinnie Paul was not psyched on it. I mean, if he was here, yeah, he would be like, I, not I think it's a cool. It. I think it's a cool opportunity to hear Pantera's music live in that, yeah, uh, totally. environment for the newer generations and even the guys that missed it, like me. I never, I never saw Pantera live before. Yeah, that, like, you know, so it, awesome. it is an opportunity yeah. for me to experience it in the live setting. But at the same time, I did have that initial knee-jerk reaction of yeah no this yeah, is yeah. a money grab type deal or whatever but i don't know i do their, their first show i was sitting here updating youtube just refreshing it until like because i knew they were playing mexico and i was sitting here like all night until a video popped up i was like nice. i need to see the first. i was yeah, like i want to see what's going to happen yeah. and the one cool thing that they do is if you go see the show which i i hope to see it but it's not coming anywhere near here at the moment but they do have a lot of in between stop black like the crowd and just show videos of like them having fun and dying bag. I'd, I'd probably just go there and cry a bunch if I went there. You know, it was all of them just having fun with like a sad kind of like Pantera slower song in the background. And they're just like partying and showing dime a bunch and Vinny a bunch. And mm -hmm. it's like really like kind of like almost like a funeral. It feels like because they throw this these like fucking montages of right. all of them having fun and stuff. And that's the part I was like, that's sick. I love that. That's like totally awesome, you know? And, but anyways, I still think it's awesome no matter what, but I just know that I knew Vinnie Paul wouldn't. I think the cynic that. focus <laughs> tour is going to kind of be like that. The way that Paul had been talking about it on previous episodes and mm -hmm. how that's going to be kind of a, a tribute thing to the Sean's, you know, there yeah. hasn't been something like that and he was talking about having the whole video aspect going too so i think that's going to be a really cool tour to go that's to as well. and hats off to benante he really yeah. pulled it you know he yeah. really you know what totally. i love about him he's always been a good even i mean dude we, i know a lot of people are not after our fans but if you if you just took all the guitars and the vocals away dude his drumming don't tell me he sucks because he does not suck that no, guy's not an animal. he's an dude. animal I argue that SOD created the, the blast beat with milk. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can almost second you on that. Yeah, yeah. I, can. That, I mean, he he's he's always had a good groove. He's always been an in-the-pocket drummer, and I love what he did. He went in, and you, I could, I could see it. He said, okay, I'm going to my drum room. I'm going to figure out what Vinny did, and he freaking nailed it. Nailed he's, it. When yeah. did that SOD record come out? What year? Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. 85, was 80, it? Yeah, 84. Is that Budokan? Yeah. Is that the Budokan one, right? It was the live of the Budokan. Was, was that before Speaking Lister Die? Or was it, was no, it was Speaking Lister Die. It was Milk. Milk was that. that, was, that they, I remember like well, listening to interviews recently, too, about like how they got the whole album done like instrument wise in like three days or two days or something. And then 
like a uh, fucking goddamn what's the singer's name i just i met him he was like the scariest person i was like scared to meet him but i, I had, it was like my i was literally the most intimidated i've ever been uh, billy milano like, billy milano. Milano. that's right that's right yeah yeah, he was in uh, Austin when we were suffocation. He was just in the fucking hallway overloading shit out. And I'm like, fucking Billy Milano's right there. That's like, to me, that was the, the most tough thrash singer of all time. That was the scariest thrash metal singer that would just like down to like do a backflip off the top speaker while I was a fat guy and just like go and just start punching people and like go back to the crowd. And like, say some pretty controversial stuff. While he's well, doing I mean, nowadays, he, he, yeah. dude, he did he not didn't give a fuck. I mean, he had like, you know, he had dude, Scott Eden. You know, like, there's the N word is on MOD, dude. Come on, dude. Is it? I mean, this is, I'm talking about SOD. I don't know. I'm you're you're more current than I am. <laughs> current? That's right before <laughs> SOD. Dude. Is it before or after? I, it was after. I don't know if it is. It's actually. after for sure. No, I think it MOD after. was Milano of Death, and then it was Stormtroopers of Death. But um, yeah, I know it's it was it was it was weird. But um, um, I, I mean, also Mike Patton did a cover of Speak uh, Spanish or Die, like. Oh. Did, uh, <laughs> Yeah, he did some stuff for Brahedia too, right? I mean, yeah, he did, yeah, he did great exactly. He was doing, doing Brahedia. I totally. I heard Montando had us. I'm like, this is this is the best thing I've I ever was, heard. The yeah, production sounded like dog crap, and it's yeah, like, yeah, you're thinking it's some ghetto thugs in the Mexican prison recording this album, and it was all <laughs> to totally. I mean, um, what's it called? I was just hanging out with. Uh, I mean, I was just hanging out in August with Psycho Fest. I was uh, my buddy uh, Steve from Cephalic, and. Um, he was playing guitar in Bredia for a while. He was like, oh, yeah, I've been playing guitar with him for a while. Like, I was like, just has the mask on. No one knows who he is. And he was like, oh, yeah, it was like a They're gig. Awesome, and I, Yeah, yeah. It's like one of my favorite guitar players. So I was like, that's fucking sick. That's yeah, freaking man. cool. Yeah. No, but totally. now let's see. We got, so we were talking about. I love you getting you, back on you, the timeline. Wait. That's sick. Well, no, quick, I, I, no. I, 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 got, I could do this till five in the morning. I could talk about anything all day long. Professor, what were you, you got something to say? Just on the Brujeria thing, uh, my call, my colleague at uh, School of Rock told me today. He found out today that he's opening for Brujeria on a tour, and Dude, I wanted to. Sh- I'm looking to. I'm looking up his band name so I can shout them out, but I don't have it yet. But anyway, yeah, Brujeria are, are going to tour. Yeah, I, I might be breaking that. That might not be. Is that uh, witchcraft in Spanish? Is that what it is? Yes. Nice. Yeah, and, Bre- and, and Montando Heros was like killing blondes or something. I, I, I used to ask my Spanish teacher in high school, "What does this mean?" <laughs> I said, "Hey, can we? Can I? Can I show this music at a class?" She said, "Señor Viela, no." <laughs> <laughs> there was that one with the, with the the beheaded person. My brother used used to have when I was a little kid, and I was like, uh, yeah, "Oh my god, god. that's good the yeah. shit out of me." Mrs. Calvar, boy, she was the best Spanish teacher, and I'd show her. She said, "Señor Viela, this is garbage." <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> to help us? Uh, oh my gosh, dude, that's so good. <laughs> but now we we're talking about how um you know kind of like coming coming up in the ranks, how joining Lust of Decay. So yeah, we're back to the 2003 fest, right? Gringos, yeah. So coming back to the 2003, so we had we were next to Sapergenic, right? So we nobody knew who Lust of Decay was, right? Yeah, nobody. yeah. yeah. So I said I said to the sound guy, I said, look, do me a favor. I'll buy you a couple beers. Will you please play our demo? He was like, yeah, dude, cool. I mean, it was really cool. It's like, yeah. So he threw that thing in and you had festering and a couple songs. In between bands setting up, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all of a sudden, dude, I'm looking around the room and I see all the dudes with Sapergenic on. Nice. And then I see the guitarist. He goes, this is cool. I'm like, all right, we've arrived. Sapergenic said thumbs up, you know, like we we, we thought we made a platinum album. Totally. And, and the same. We're around, yeah, we're looking around the room, dude, and people are like, they're getting into it. I'm like, we might actually have something here for Underground Death Metal. So that album came out, and it, and honestly, it was so cool because that was the MySpace era, and we, you know, we we didn't have any of the Zoom or nothing. It was, you know, it was it was so next level for us just to be able to put out a great album. We I recorded all the drum tracks. I've always done my albums in two to three hours. Drums are done two to three hours. I have a I have a, I have a motto. If I can't do drums in three hours, I just need to quit. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I know yeah. I have a lot of pressure I on. Think, so you need to hit up Eric Rutan, dude. Yeah, 
Now I'm getting a little older. My three to four hours, I need to quit. You know, <laughs> give myself it's an like, hour. It's like a golf, like a handicap. Like, oh, my handicap's going up a little for a decade. Give myself an hour, you know. <laughs> but uh, but no, like seriously, man. Like we we did that and started gaining some steam. And we, I mean, dude, it was crazy. Like it was so cool. Like we really started getting people from Israel, Greece, Italy. It was really cool. Like how many people were hitting us up, and um. It was that so came cool. out on Comatose, right? Comatose, yep. Yeah, okay. that was yeah, Comatose. Yeah. I think the first. I think it was his first album. And um, really, first yeah. full release. Wow. Yeah, I think so. It was Holy that shit. or one other thing? But he, it was right there. And what was cool too, man. Is like I started getting no, no dude. John Gallagher from Dying Fetus emailed me. And said, "Hey, I'm thinking about doing a side project. You want a drum wipe? There's a bear crap in the woods. Come on." <laughs> No. You know, like let's yeah. freaking go, but nothing ever came out of it. But it right. was just but so at cool. least the conversation happened, dude. John Gallagher, the fact that he even thought about me, I mean, yeah. I'm a piss stain on underwear of Trey, but like the fact that he even reached out to me to say, That's Hey, bad. man, you're, you're killing it, you know. And um, there was so so bears, many- don't, bears don't crap in the woods, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, dude, they crap in the river while they're catching their salmon. The river. <laughs> so basically, what happened was. That happened. That album came out. So that was long before uh, Kingdom of Corpses. And Kingdom of Corpses was a... Fr- I, I hate that album. It was a train wreck. People love that album. I don't know how they love it. I sucked on that album. But anyhow, to Botify, I want I wound up meeting from that guy, Trent. I told you all about He had a buddy, Chris, that I met. And Chris Bronstein, we wind up talking. And um, Basically, we wound up, that's how the Botify got started. We were infatuated with Dying Fetus, um, Pyemia, Disavowed, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Panzer Christ, Reno Killerich, like all these drummers started. Remember that picture I sent you of my first toolbox, dude, and with the De- Botified sticker on it? That, was, that came in a, a, a comatose order of, uh, I think I got, yeah, it was a Lust of Decay and De Botified. No, you have truly shown the gray hairs on my beard from that sticker. A shout to Arse Breed. Remember the Pyamia oh members? Oh my gosh, yeah. Remember Roman, that? Oh, yeah, dude. Roman Golan, he was a drummer, yeah, right? Yeah. Insane. Yeah, yeah. That was like a one-off album that I was like obsessed with. I loved it totally. at the time when it came out. I heard his drumming. I'm like, who is this freaking guy? Yeah, yeah. Even uh, for, I think even George she was like, dude, this guy? Check this guy out. Now, George, that's a big, that's a tall order coming from George, you know? Totally. Um, so, yeah, man. So, the Botify, dude, we were on fire, man. Um, I, I apologize. Let me rewind. I'm getting my mind. We're talking about so many things. So, let me rewind. I apologize. The Botify was first. I'm sorry. The Botify actually was first. Wow. That's we, the first yeah. comatose release. Dude, me and Chris, we practice relentlessly. And we came out with the Botify. That album, man, like I, li- I listened to it. I'm like, man, wow, that really was a cool album. Yeah, you were saying those were one takes, right? All one takes, man. Damn. I was on fire that day. I met some new girl. We're going on a date that night. I was like, all right. You know, like everything was going great, you know? So I'm like, life life is good today. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? But we we nailed that, man. We put out a great album. Yep, Fotis Bernardo, man. He's a freaking animal. Um, but uh, anyhow, we did that album. And then that's when Lust of Decay came about. You know, we started, I wound up joining them and then Debotified wound up debanding after because, or disbanding, whatever they call it, because he was pissed off that I joined Lust of Decay. It was a, it was a big fiasco. We're still friends mm-hmm. today, but mm-hmm. at the time he was pissed because he wanted to be, he just wanted to be the focus to be Debotified, which I understand. Yeah. I had a big ego. I wanted to play drums in every damn band, you right. know? Like if Mike would have quit Deeds of Flesh and they'd be like, hey, we want to play? I'd be like, sure, sign me up. You know, like I would have been that guy. I wouldn't have been able to hang, but I would have been that guy anyway. And um, basically the Botify kind of went to the went to the wayside and then Lost the Decay started taking off. So what happened was you talk about the Nile incident. So basically, this is I think after when we went to do the second album. Um, because that was that fest was 2004. So yes, so. I think we did Kingdom of Corpses. It was 2004, maybe after. I'm not sure. My drumming started heightening, and then I started getting some recognition. And then I wound up meeting John Vasano, who was the bassist at the time for Nile. Meeting John Vasano through my guitarist Chris from the Botify. They were friendly. At the time, John Vasano, uh, for before he joined Nile, he was in a band called Dark Moon, and also before Dark Moon, a band called Demonic Christ. 
they were the bands back in the 90s in Charlotte. Like you, everybody went to see those boys play. My buddy mm -hmm. Scott Smith, who I'm still friends with today, he was a drummer. Dude, they were they were relentless. They would play an yeah. hour set, and guys, I'm telling you, B B BPMs from 210 to 215, 220, nonstop all the way through, nonstop. Yeah. So John Vasano wanted, you know, getting on board with Nile. And then I wound up getting a call from him one day at work. And he was like, hey, dude, um, Tony got missing or something happened with him with him, some touring conflict or something. And they couldn't work it out with Nile. They had that big fest in Amsterdam. You want to fill in? And I was like, yeah. You know, I was like, sure. I'm going to put my big boy pants on. <laughs> I will tell you this right now. I had a set to learn in five weeks. I had to fill in for Tony Loriano. So let's just say that right there. Okay. Yeah. I had to cover mm. the first song was um, the first track off of that album. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Blessed Dead. That's a really difficult song to play. Mm. I don't care who the hell you are. doesn't matter what drummer is that. That is a tough song to play. Even trying to play the George's click track on YouTube. It's it, you're talking to 220 plus BPMs. And the time changes, the signatures are all over the place. So I had to learn that, and we had to do Nephron Ka stuff. Um, but basically, how long was this the set? Set was about, I think the set was eight to nine songs. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, we played. We played um, Sarcophagus. We played. Um, yes, we played Winds of Horse. That's a great. That was freaking fun. Blessed Dead. Um, we played um, Joseph, you're muted. Black Seeds of Vengeance. We played another track, and we played a couple songs off of Nephron Ka. So we wanted to play an eight to nine tracks. It was probably about 35, 40 minutes of material. So yeah, that 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 was uh, that was something, man. I, I I will say that out of all the years of my life, I'm no regrets, man. I mean, that was the most stressful moment of my life. The girl hated me because yeah, the girl that <laughs> I would date at the time, she didn't see me because I was in my drum shed day and night practicing. So I'd practice in the morning. I'd work all day and I'd, after work, I'd go back in the shed because I had to practice these songs. Yeah. I was listening to the music when I go to bed. So it would stick in my brain like I was obsessed. Yeah. Okay. We went though, man. We went, we pulled it off. You know, I didn't train wreck anything. Um, Joseph, you were asking if there was video footage. Basically, what happened? <laughs> I remember being in the dressing room with them and a girl came in, said, Hey, can we videotape? So you have to actually ask the bank, can we videotape your set? They have to sign a contract. So Niall's freaking high profile. It's very professional. They had a voucher like anything you want. If you want a Jim Beam, they have a bottle for you. So basically, the, uh, Carl was like, well, considering the situation we're in, I don't feel comfortable with you guys recording myself. And it kind of pissed me off because I'm like, dude, I'm getting paid dog piss to do this. Mm -hmm. I'm 24. It's an experience. I'm going to do it because it's, it's, it's great for me. It's a learning experience. And I want to be on stage at Nile. I was, you know, at a young age, but I'm like, you don't, you don't think I could pull it. I wanted to say, you don't think I could pull this off. But so they never videotaped this. You don't see no footage whatsoever. Nobody had phone mm -hmm. footage, nothing on YouTube, which really mm -hmm. sucks because it was a great freaking set. Right. Yeah. You would love to have the archive of that just time in your life too. You know, even like, when we were kid, when we were first touring Anthony, like we had like fucking the first like like round of digital cameras. Like yeah. we had like yeah. you know we didn't have like you know if we were, we could do like post stories on Instagram, like it would be banana. Yeah, talent. and and <laughs> I'm actually kind of sad because I can't find the camera that I had taken. I have it. Us. I actually have it some mine somewhere. But yeah, that's that's uh it's we it was enough to have it was enough technology to have the yeah. the little uh micro card in or whatever yeah yeah but yeah. still you had to have a separate camera and i did take a camera on that tour and there is a lot of pictures and and footage but it, it is i'm sure it's going to be grainy and shitty and one thing i hold against tony i call him loreno but it's maybe because i'm lazy <laughs> um it's loreano okay loreano. we were on tour with our, our our tour met up with the haunted and we were at the medley in um in montreal and i was waiting for the shower i was like the grossest person ever and i was like i need the shower <laughs> and there's someone in the shower there's one shower there at the medley and i was like oh fuck so you shower. jumped like, in I'm... with them and then you no 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 
No, he didn't squatting. Fin- he, yeah, he didn't finish me. <laughs> started squatting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he didn't squat. Yeah, he didn't finish me off. <laughs> <laughs> Professor <laughs> coming through with the stream. No, I was fine right there. Dude, dude. My fucking quads were like already murdering right now. I'm in fucking Montreal, dude. I could fucking squat. I'm standing in a squat position for an hour. But I was waiting for the shower. I was sitting there just like with my towel waiting. And then one of the guys from the haunt or something was using it. And I was like, all right, I get next. I'm psyched. And then the door opens and Tony just walks in, just like goes right in front of me and steals oh, it from me. <laughs> you, dude. And I didn't even know him yet. And I was like, I was like, forever fuck Tony. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like so stinky. I was like looking for it. And I was probably waiting for like 25 minutes. And I was like, I got the next. And then he just goes in and just takes like an hour in there. And I'm like, bro, I got to like get ready for the show that you're, you're tech. He was teching for the haunted, I think. And uh, yeah. um, I was like. Yeah. I was so butthurt. I was like that because a shower was like, like that's, now, like, that's a prize. That's like seven thousand dollars that someone gave me. Seven thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, no, right it's now. true. I can imagine, dude. Like I hear the stories of you guys touring. Like, yeah. and it's funny. Like, what I was gonna say is that when Carl, like, I spoke to Carl on the phone, and I, dude, I was, I was a young kid. I was making at the time. I was making like eighty five grand at like twenty three. Like that was a lot of money. Nice, yeah, like, that was like making a buck fifty now. You know, totally. yeah. and I was like. And I'm, 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 I just say that because I was making good money as a young guy and, and the profession that I still do today, which I love. I'm a salesman. Awesome. In, yeah. in the supplement industry, like I have a huge passion for health and fitness. So, Killer. yeah. So, like, basically, when he called me, I said, it, it was just so cool. Like, I was part of that history because I got to see before George even got there. Because Carl came to me, like, dude, if, if things could have been different, if I would have been looking to tour, I might have been their drummer. Uh, I'm not being funny. Like, I am not a George Coldius. I'm me. But – they were looking for a drummer and they heard of George and they were already starting to, you know, contact mm-hmm. him and get a hold of George. Cause what you, what George said is 100% correct. I mean, everything, what he said is exactly that timeline. Mm-hmm. So to hear Dallas playing, you know, annihilation riffs was so cool. Like this is stuff that wasn't even out yet, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, and I was, I remember he was playing some riffs and I was just jamming to it, having fun. He was like, Oh, that's a cool riff. You know what like, so being a part of that, just being in the room with Dallas, because Dallas is a really cool dude. Oh, yeah. Right, dude. We had a great time with him on our episode, dude. Yeah, Dal- Dallas is just – he was a lot of fun. Dad's more – you know, Dallas is more low-key guy. Carl's more of the extrovert businessman. And I got to hang out with John. John's, you know, hardcore. But he, he was really cool. And I got to know him personally because he doesn't live too far from me in Charlotte. Um, so just being a part of something, dude, and, dude, looking out and you when you see a tent – and I thought there was about 2,000 people, John said, this 10 holds 10. Whoa. I was like, there's 10,000 people, says Jordan. I've done a handful of these. That's 10,000 people. I came yeah. out to get my gear. Carl and everybody were already in the backstage, and Carl just came out to get a pedal. I walk out. Everybody's still there. I'm like, why is everybody still here? Dude, I got my trigger, and they all started screaming and chanting something to me. And I'm like, and Carl looked at me. He went, and I'm Here like, we go. yeah, yeah. Dude, I was like, how is this even possible? Like, totally. I suck compared to Tony Loreano and <laughs> these people. You know, it was humbling, man. Um, you probably feeling... let people sh- you probably let people shower better, though. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't cut somebody in line getting in the shower. You wait behind. You them. cut me again. I'll cut you. Um, <laughs> so basically, you know that that happened. And honestly, guys, I will say that. From that moment of doing Nile, they kind of like follow the timeline of things that happened. That that moment, my drumming started to escalate because I started emulating Tony. That's why you guys know me for all the roles and things that I do. That was Tony Loriano influencing me. Mm-hmm. I started understanding everything. was He was a 16 notes guy. So everything mm-hmm. was bombastic. And everything was that bass drum. Totally. So everything yeah. was a metronome with the bass drum. I learned that from Nile. Hey, when you do a drum roll, keep that bass drum going. I learned how mm-hmm. to one foot blast with Nile because Pete Hamura did one foot blast. So okay. I learned how to one foot blast with them instead of traditional blasting. I learned a lot understanding really what goes down in the business, just a one trip seeing really what goes into it. It's a lot, man. I learned that Europeans take metal a hell lot more serious than Americans do. Yeah. You know, it's it's a really really Mariano. Mariano. Mar- yeah. <laughs> really, it's a really different thing. Um, but going from that, coming back, that's when we started doing purity mm-hmm. and um Solarino. <laughs> 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 it's a fucking Chris Mahara. 
<laughs> yeah, I love you, buddy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So basically, that's that's pretty much the transition that that helped to propel my drumming into purity through this membermint, which by far was the best drumming I did, the most mature drumming, the most influenced drumming that I did. I became, I was getting, you know, I was getting a little bit older. I was, pl- I was obviously my, my chops were coming up. I was practicing relentlessly five to six days a week. It was nonstop. Mm-hmm. Lost the decay practice twice a week. Um, we were in it to win it. Um, you know, so unfortunately I couldn't tour because of work. I made sure right away that even at a young age, I'm like, I'm not built to be a touring drummer. I'm too regimented. Like I hear the stories you guys tell about touring. I would have lost my mind, Joel. Like I hear the stories you guys talk about when you're decrepit and all this stuff. I'm like, if that would have yeah. happened to me, I would have come. I wasn't mature enough. I would have come unglued. Yeah. yeah. I would have probably gotten a fist fights with people on tour bus because they're. Acting That's why you need people like me who like are empathetic and listen to everyone. And I'm the fucking middleman for everyone. I have to like right, right. make sure everything's cool. Like everyone's tells me, this guy, fuck this guy, fuck this guy. I'm like, all right, right. Figure Absolutely. out like, how to do. You need one of those guys in your band if you're gonna do like a like be like a successful band. If you have like big personalities in your band, you have to really have someone in the middle, or like they have to have like an understanding, or all sit down because a lot of people don't understand like the mental fortitude it takes to like. Like someone could walk, someone could like move over in their bunk or, or something weird. And you're like, fuck that asshole. You know what I mean? After a while, right. you start getting like really snappy over stuff. And, and it really comes down to like really small details that need to be figured sure. out if you're going to like live with them. You know, you know, you know, who did a good, you know, who did a good job explaining. I really love, I mean, Joseph, you know him, um, Eugene from Ryabchenko. Mm-hmm. He's top notch. I love his, di- I love his diaries. I've watched them yeah. all. He, I, I messaged him quite a bit, and I said, "Dude, you really do a good job fundamentally breaking down. Hey, you're gonna get sick. You're gonna yeah. this. You're gonna be peeing in a cup. You're gonna whatever. You're gonna be eating like dog crap. You have to find a way to take your supplements, like all kinds of stuff." But Scott uh, from Carnifex did a great job. I love Scott. Like, yeah, he, I mean, dude, they're one of my favorites. Carnifex is, oh my gosh, dude, yeah, they're yeah. so freaking good. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. For Deathcore, they they are they are the pinnacle in my opinion. But um, basically, Scott did a good job saying, hey, man, on the on the bus, you know, there's rules like you have to mm-hmm. when you're touring enough, you know, you only go here at a certain time. The back of the bus is for lounging. If you want to do business, that's not the place to do it. Or you want to get down with a chick or whatever the case may, whatever you're doing on tour, that's not the place to do it. It's like he he really it was cool. I respect that because this is what these guys do. Right. That's yeah. their livelihood. It's their house. You're in their house. Yeah. Like you're in house. their living space. Yeah. 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 People get, I mean, as humans or animals, you get protective over your space. That's like sure. how it goes. I know? just knew, like, it's kind of funny. Like, before we got this on this podcast, I was thinking, I'm just kind of reminiscing a little bit about the past. That's funny about when we were coming back from the Chicago Fest. Jay, me and Jay are like freaking frack. We make fun of each other. Like, Jay and I have been running together since I joined Lost of Decay. And we, we are both the same personalities, which is not good. It's like fire and it's like fire. It's like fire and matches. Uh, fire and matches and gasoline. It's fire and fuel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire and fuel. But basically, you know, it's funny. We had this conversation. We said, you know, if we were a touring band, him and I would have to separate ourselves from each other for a certain amount of time throughout the day because we would butt heads too much. Even though we love mm-hmm. each other, because we and him and I are like he lives nine miles from my house. I see him all the time. Mm-hmm. We're like this, but we're so alike and so extroverted that it wouldn't work on the road. So we knew, like you said, you have to have a buffer. You have to have a guy that, like, yes. a, like Steve Green, our guitarist, he's real chill. Phil, our bass is Phil Good. He is like ice cold chill. You know, yeah. Ryan, our rhythm is. He's, so we have that in the middle. Him and I would have to be, otherwise it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. It's like two boundaries, like between like the chill people and between you guys. <laughs> sure, we want to punch and jump in the face at the end of tour. There's no doubt. Him and I almost got into it a couple times recording yeah. in the studio. Oh, sure. Dude, because him and I are so strong and we love our music so much. Him and I almost came to blows a couple times that we we knew when to stop as adult men because I would I would never want to fight my bandmate. That's not a good place to be. Right. Yeah. Well, but you know that's when you when that when it gets to that point, better hang it up. Hang yeah. it up. You guys are done because if there's that much hate. It goes, my wife and I are in marriage ministry, right, with, for our church. So we always tell couples, like, not to get off beat here, but you'll see where I'm going with this. We tell mm-hmm. couples, if you get to that level of excessiveness, it goes it's much done. deeper than the issue. It's not the issue. It goes much deeper down the rabbit hole. It's like ego issue. Yeah, it gets, like, way mm-hmm. deeper. Correct. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So basically, first lust of decay came out. We go to the set. We go to uh, Kingdom of Corpses. So I don't know if you guys have blasted that album, but uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, we do guys. This album was an absolute disaster. Material is unbelievable. Steve Green's guitar writing. Steve is, and it's not because he's my guitarist. I will. Mm. He is my favorite rhythm guitarist in death metal because he is solid, concrete solid on stage. Mm. Barely messes up. It's scary. And the riffs he comes up with, he has his own style. So when you hear it, you're like, that's Lust of Decay. That's Steve Green playing guitar. Yeah, mm. sick. Great album. Do we go to record, right? So we go to the original studio for um, that we did the first album at. We were very, his guy's name was Art Bordeaux. Cool little studio, did a lot of radio broadcasting and stuff out of there, but he was a cool dude, kind of a burner, but old school, old soul. And he just kind of knew knew the lay of the land. And we like what he did with our first album. Mm -hmm. We go there, we set up everything, we play. It sounded like absolute dog crap. So we said, okay, we scrapped that, right? So we wasted a whole freaking weekend on that, right? Check this out. We go to the same studio that did the Debotified album. Now, this was a decent studio, big place. Y'all would have loved this place. It was giant. You had a nice place to put your drums. You had a vocal booth, sound room, the whole nine yards. The guy did everything himself, right? Went there. Guys, we spent the entire day recording drums, had everything nailed, right? Mm -hmm. Go back, gone. Uh, Got erased somehow? He raced the entire studio project. Uh, Steven, Steven was, I was, first of all, that material is freaking tough to play. Okay. Mm, yeah. We had a good studio, good miking. This guy had like unlimited tracks. Tracks. The Botify was a good, wholesome death metal sounding album. We were going to get even better than that. Deleted everything on accident. So wow. there we go. Finally, your genius friend Jordan over here said, "Oh, let's check out this. Let's check out this project studio, Studio Gray in Charlotte, not too far from my house." This guy did not know what he was doing. He didn't understand death metal. Yeah, yeah. We record the whole album there, so the album was done in his studio. Jay said, "Jordan, you don't even understand how many times we went back to his house to mix this thing. They probably went to his house seventy times to mix it. Just couldn't get it right. I hate the sound of that album." If we would have done it where we should have done purity, album would have been a gem. But it is what it is. It's history. The album came out, and Lyle from Defeated Sadness, like, oh, freaking love that album. I'm like, that's like dog crap. How do you like that album? Yeah. It's because it's because it's dog crap to a lot of people, but to them, like, you know, they find these underground things that they love about it, and it's like everyone's like, well, it's not like it's not, uh, all the popular crowd or whatever's like, yo, it doesn't sound like how it's supposed to sound. But then the people that like are dorks about it are like. That's sick. I like the playing on it. That's what I want. Fuck the sound. Fuck the sound. So, I so want the. I want. Yeah. So you remember Despondency's got on acid that album? Oh I want yeah. My Fuck drums yeah. to sound like that. Yes. Holy it God, does not sound like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, we, we go down the rabbit hole. That's so anyhow. That album comes out. We have a great response. Play a lot of shows, a lot of fests, and then we start writing for Purity, which that album is freaking. That album is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're that's talking a, about domination through impurity. Do, no, that's a no domination through impurity. That's all. That's a we probably have to have a whole other co- podcast for that, dude. Mm. Uh, that's actually one of my favorite things you've done, dude. Yeah, Masochist. That album was some of the best music I've ever written. In oh, the fuck. I haven't. That was you. <laughs> that was me. Yeah. Domination through impurity was me on both albums, me and Joe Payne. Yep. Holy yeah, shit. Bit, Joe it, Payne. The first one Joe mainly Payne, right? is the one that I had my connection with and. Yeah, dude, that's where I uh, Whoa, we've talked about all the ever. lust of decay, debodified, and domination through impurity solidified you as a great drummer Thank for you. me. Hearing the you know the range across those three projects and your ability and ideas that you executed on those albums, dude. Yeah. That's Damn. why you're on the show, dude. I forgot Damn. all about this. I'm listening to it right now. I used to listen to this all the time. Yeah. This is insane, dude. Yeah, Jordan fucking fuck? rips know. on that shit, dude. He Joe really Payne. So Joe Payne, how that came about. Joe yeah, rest Payne. in peace, right? Uh, he was he was in uh Nile for a little while, right? He, was was in Nile. he toured in Nile for a long time. He took over Joe's band. What's that? 
Dino Cazares' band, Fine. right? Fine, have received. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, yeah, I used to go there and smoke a bunch of pot with him. I, I yep. miss Jim Fine. Payne a lot. He got to play. He played. He was flying out to L.A. all the time for Dino. D Joe Joe Payne, you know. I know, I know. What a fucking talent! And he like his stage presence, everything he had dialed. When I saw him, like, like Joe Payne, he, dude. He, I always told people this because before you, but Joe, before you came on, I was telling um, uh, Casey and, and Anthony that you realize in this music, you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And then the guys that get it, they have to work really hard to get there. And I madly respect that because what we do is really difficult. Death metal is really difficult. It, yeah. it takes grit. It hurts your body. Like it, it, it takes a lot of fortitude. But Joe Payne, his level of talent. Remember something? He joined Lust of Decay. He was eighteen. Yeah, yeah, so he, yeah. So he came down to practice. This is before Kingdom of Corpses. We were writing Kingdom of Corpses. We gave him Cognitive Decimation, which is still one of my favorite songs. A couple other songs to memorize. Do that kid within one week. Learned the material, came down. That kid was windmilling the yeah. entire time. Oh, yeah. And, so, no. and didn't miss a freaking note. Totally. No, I noticed that didn't about him, too, like, seeing him live. Like, I remember uh, – he reminds me, actually, a lot of um, – we've had him on recently. Uh, Mike Leon. Like, 100%. kind of looks like, like he's kind of this guy that's, like, made for his position. Like, he – was thrown into like I don't know a humongous band when he was a kid and just nailed it. And Freak talent. Freak yeah, talent. Yeah, totally. It's it's yeah, uncanny. Mike. You don't you, you can't write it. You either have it or you don't. Your nervous system moves a certain way. It just if his body was meant that kid could have played for Garth Brooks. He could have played for anybody. Yeah, he could have played dive bar metal. He could have played for freaking Tina Turner. He could have done whatever he wanted to was do with it. Out of Atlanta, I want to say right he okay. was out of Georgia, correct. He Georgia. Lived in, okay, okay, okay. He lived in the Carolinas we met him because we actually, Ryan Menino was our rhythm guitarist for Lust of Decay for a minute. He was actually a very good guitarist as a kid. Um, we met, we, he's like, hey, my buddy Joe plays bass. Like, dude, bring him down. We need a bassist. Yeah. So we came down. And then after that, him and I got very close. And then we said, you know, he always, well, he was a Meshuggah fanatic. Meshuggah fanatic. And yeah. Chaos Sphere and all this stuff. And he That's introduced okay. me to some of that. And, I was like, dude, let's make some mathematical, technical death metal. Let's go nuts. Let's do something stupid. Dude, yeah. that first album came out, and people were like, what in the hell? Like, this is this is cool. I played yeah. the entire kit on my electronic drum set with real cymbals. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I was going to actually mention that. I was like, that that does sound like a triggered yeah. album, but it actually is a more, nat more natural-sounding triggered album. Yep. Yeah. Well, remember, we did that album, so we did. So Purity, the reason why Purity sounds decent is because we did the same Purity in the same studio Niall did uh, their first three albums. Four, sorry, four albums. We went to, we went to uh, the, the Sound Lab, which I miss so much. When yeah. I, I went to contact Bob Moore, he was a sound engineer. He, him and I worked together so good because he was the opposite of me. Calm, cool, collective, quiet dude, but smart and knew how to mix, man. Knew how to run a board. And um, I went to call the guy. No answer, no nothing. I wound up getting a hold of Kreishloff from uh, um, uh, was a lecherous nocturne. No, oh, yeah, I said, dude, what's going on with it? Is it? He's like, Doc, dude, he closed shop a while ago because everybody's recording at their house now. So. He's losing business left and right. You know, he didn't charge a lot. He was like 35 bucks an hour. It wasn't bad. Mm -hmm. That's cheap. You know, um, you, do, you do like an eight hour block for 350. Like it wasn't bad. Right. We did our first, both domination albums were done there. The masochist I did on real drums. I actually had a custom made kit from uh, Mark Ross percussion, maybe a custom made drum kit, which I did Kingdom of Corpses and masochist on um, that album. Vaughn Young from Lividity. He had Epitomite Productions. He signed us. And I'm going to tell you something. He believed, he gave us, I'm talking a rock star budget to do that album. Like it wasn't like, here's a thousand bucks. Like it was multis of thousand bucks to do this album. Very yeah. generous. He loved that band. You know? Oh, yeah. So um, it was really cool to do that with him. And we put out some, I mean, unfortunately, it never really got the notoriety it needed because we just, you know, we didn't tour. Um we could have been like a putrid pile with just two dudes, you know, like it would have been cool if we would have been able to tour, but it just didn't gain the steam it needed to. Um, so 
the third third lust of the uh, third lust of the uh, decay came out and that album was even like uh eric uh god rest his soul he uh he contacted steve he said you boys really stepped it up on this album which is really cool. oh yeah he was doing trades at unique and stuff and uh he was buying some stuff from unique and eric's like you boys stepped it up on this album and that album uh yes no definitely Lynn Lindmark. i miss that guy he was such a yeah me too man good man dude such a good dude oh yeah totally I know. Hey, are you ta- you you're talking about purity through disem- dismemberment? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Purity so that album, man, um, it was actually pretty cool. That album, man. That's when I started really getting crafty. I said I had a had a good, actually, this kit right here that you're seeing oh, right there. Sick. Yeah, yeah. That's the same kit I did for domination through impurity, and um, I did for actually purity through dismemberment. I recorded the, all the toms. And I actually utilized the electronic chinas because they sounded so good. In his studio, he knew how to blend everything good. I used real cymbals, too, and I used a real snare drum. And obviously, I used a D5 trigger at the time with my rolling kick pad, which I'm known for. I play live at it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we that album came out, and that was that was big boy pants we filled on that album. And then uh, pretty much we rode the coattails on that album for a while. Things got stale. Um we were driving. I mean, going to Steve's house was 40 miles there and 40 miles back, dude. I did that twice a week. It got old after after a long time. You yeah. know, we weren't progressing. See, I'm the kind of guy, man, that I have to have a goal. Like, I have to progress. So, like, for instance, my second in Concord album, I don't even have the physical copies. Hopefully, they land tomorrow my, at my house. I already have album three written, album four written. I'm getting ready to start writing album five. I have to have something going on. I can't stay stagnant. I can't rest on my laurels. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Right. What are we doing? How are we going to become better? Or are we just going to suck and stay the same? You know? And Mm -hmm. I just, I couldn't progress at the time because less than a case, Steve had a lot going on with Comatose. And these guys are my bandmates. I would say this in front of them. Jay was my biggest cheerleader. It's like Jordan hanging there, hanging there. We're going to write more material. And finally, dude, like after a year, I'm like, I just got burnt out. I said, you know what? I'm done. This was a long time ago. That's when Shuriken came about. So, and this is getting into the new projects. I always, I was Steve, you could say, what is your most favorite death metal drummer? Steve Shine from that Deicide is an absolute machine. To this yeah. day, he is a machine. Totally. That guy is high as a kite. When he, and I, I don't condone it, but he's high as a kite when he gets on stage. And that guy <laughs> does not miss a freaking beat. Right. He's, friendly, he's courteous. Every time I watched him play, you know, he's a machine. So I, I always loved Aeon, Sanctification, oh, yeah. writes Aeon, Sanctification, yeah. Niles Yelstrom, and Tony Westermark are some of my favorite drummers. That all, all checks out with that project for me, dude. 100%. Niles, yeah. so here's a kicker, right? My biggest influences at that time was R2 Malky. So do you remember the face creation? Yeah. Hell yeah. The face creation was before that became. I'm a a proud owner of that, that full length. Dude. Dude, I'm telling you right now. Physical copy. That is the best death metal album of all time. I could listen. I could put that album on repeat all day long and never get tired. Thank you so much for mentioning that because I'm going to be listening to that tomorrow, dude. All right, so, can we say it again? Because like we said, domination through impurity. I'm listening to it while we're talking right now, and I'm like, well, deface creation over. is pre Aeon, right? Like, oh, okay. okay, okay. creation is pre Aeon. So check this out. It had all the Daniel Lemming and all the guys from Aeon are in that band. Tommy Dahlstrom, all those guys, but it had R2 Malky. That kid is a Viking. When you blast that album, listen to his precision. There is nothing triggered on that album. Everything is acoustic. That guy is, first of all, he's a big Swede. He's a big dude. He, <laughs> Tommy even said, Tommy Dawson said, we've had amazing drummers, but he's still my favorite because he beats the living dog piss out of his drums. And yeah, yeah. R2 Malky, I, I heard the face creation. I got pissed off for coming home from a fest. I'm like, who is this freaking band? Jay was like, dude, this these dudes from Sweden. I'm listening to this band. I'm like, this freaking drummer's a machine. Yeah. I'm listening to Mike Hamilton. I hear freaking Depopulate with Tyson on there. I'm like, that's it. I got to learn how to play double bass for one, two, three minute runs. And then that's how things started progressing. That's how Shuriken came. I said, I want an, I want a project that starts to sound like a mini Deicide, Aeon, of course, a nothing on my guitar. I can't play guitar like that. Um, But basically, 
I, I love playing guitar. I love playing bass. I said, I'm going to do all the instruments. Jay, I want you to sound like Glenn Benton on crack. I said, just freaking go. And dude, we put out the first Shuriken in 2005, which was really received well. People really enjoyed it. It, it gave them that old school kind of fresh right. side sound, you know, nothing over the top, but it was in your face. It had good groove. It had meter. It stuck on time. Then my drumming started getting a lot faster. My double bass started getting more erratic and, and I started being able to do, you know, longer runs. And then that's when resuscitating the vial came out, which I think was two, 2012. Um, and um, yeah, we, we did that album and guys, not going to lie to you after that album happened, I, um, I started getting more spiritual. I started walking and, and Joel, this kind of gets into what we were okay, talking about. Okay. I wanted to try to keep you guys on basis to see what yeah, we're Finally, no, we're... after my question. All that was great. All this okay, okay. culminates. So basically okay. what happened was I've always been a huge fan of Dan Swano. Genius. Mm -hmm. Dan Swano's a genius. Scott yeah. Burns, Dan Swano, all these guys are geniuses. But Dan Swano, dude, that dude, dude, that guy could barbecue good. I mean, that guy could do everything good. <laughs> Give him a glass of water, he'll make it better than anybody. Like hole in one, go to he, He's just, he's just. <laughs> It'll be the perfect temperature, I mean, right amount of look ice. Look at his cream. roster. Look at the bands he's recorded. And look at the stuff he's done with Moon Towers, for crying out loud. Look, I mean, mm. look at Edge of Sanity's Crimson Dew. Oh, yeah. Who did all of that? Jesus. Who, who can do all that's of that? That's a fucking, like, that's like a Queensryche of, like, crazy metal. Yeah, yeah. No, Dude, he, he's an animal. So I got really inspired by him. And I did I did Symphony and Acrimony, which became mm. in Concord. So Symphony and Acrimony, you're probably not as familiar with. Um, I went to release that. Um, that was my solo project. That was my spiritual Christian, but I was very young. I wasn't a mature Christian. I was scared to say Jesus Christ on there because I was afraid people would give me the middle finger. I, I just wasn't spiritually mature, but it was all positive. It all had underlying tones of Christianity, but it was basically, I wanted to do a 30 minute long song. And that's what it was, a 30 minute long saga song, mm -hmm. which was produced to the hilt. It was done at the same studio with Bob Moore, Sound Lab, but dude, it was polished. Fuck yeah. and, um, I was supposed to put that on Deathgasm with Evan. Now he's no oh. longer Remember, remember Deathgasm? Oh, hell yeah. So hell yeah. Evan was like, hey, man, I, I saw him at the Illinois Metal Fest with Lust of Decay was playing. He was, I let him hear some material. He was all about it. He's like, you know, I really hope it's not too over the top spiritual. I'm like, Evan, look, it's my creativity. It's what I'm doing, but I'm entrusting you to put out a good album. He's like, all right, let's do it. I record the album. Came out good. I gave it to him. I don't hear from him, right? So I'm like, this guy just gave me $1,200 to record an album, which back in the day you could do a lot with in a studio. And I'm That's like, like $9 million now, right? Now, exactly. You know, back in, back in 2005, 2006, $1,200, $2,000, you could have got a pretty Mac Daddy recording. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. You know, you're, you're looking at a 36-track studio or whatever. So basically, and this isn't me bad mouth him, but this is just history of exactly what happened. He wouldn't respond to my emails, nothing. So I talked to Steve, my boy Steve from Goldman Toast. I said, Steve, have you talked to Evan? Steve's like, he's pretty pissed. I'm like, about what? I said, I gave him a good album. He's like, well, it's too Christian for him. And I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, back then, I mean, what, what year was this? This was, dude, Symphony and Acrimony, I think, came out in like 2005, 2006. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, metal's been pretty dominated by just like the you know, like anti-Christian, like, you know what I mean? You know, that's, what, that's one thing. the beginning of it. Venom and all those guys, it wasn't about God. None of it was about God. And most of them, they're, they're just talking about like a, a lore and horror story or whatever, right. like people in a, in a thing. And like, and not saying that they're Christian, but saying that they're kind of like, they want to like tell a story that's scary or right. like have that into it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So come to find out, Steve's like, yeah, dude, I don't know what it is, but he's pretty upset. I'm like, oh my gosh, freaking girl drama. So I texted <laughs> him. I emailed the guy. I'm, dude, I, I, could get a, I could get a lot more brutally honest, but I'm going to keep it politically correct in a podcast. And uh, I sent him an email. I said, hey, dude, I'm like, Steve said you're upset with me. So let's get this hashed out. I get an email back. Yeah, I'm, I'm frustrated. The logo even looks Christian, a Christian logo. I'm like, bro, stop. Whatever you're smoking, please get off of it and do something else. 
I'm like the logo. I had my buddy do it. It's a nice, clean, proper logo. It doesn't have any crosses, nothing crazy. It's just, it's a nice yeah, logo. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I love parts of the album and certain parts I didn't love. And it was just too Christian for me. And I'm like, he's like, you know what? Consider the 1200 to get the light. Don't threaten me with a good time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for yeah. the money. You want to piss away a good album? Good yeah, for you. Congratulations. Yeah. I'll take your paycheck. I was yeah, really, yeah. really angry about that. But Vaughn, who I'm still very friendly with, he was very open to many kinds of metal. And he's like, I love it. So he wound up putting it out on Epitomite. And we, I yeah. actually went back, we remixed it, we remastered it, and it wound up sounding three times better, thicker, better trigger sound. Um, then after that, guys, honestly, um, I can't really remember much that I did after that. I think, oh, I forget. I did Jay want the cesspool of vermin thing came up. Jay did with Derek. Wait, Cruz. before we move on, I just want to make one more statement that I yeah. was just thinking about, which is I've always applauded um Christian metal bands because they're they're trying to be not like rebellious they're, against they're, metal. They're, they're like exactly. rebellious. They're being, yeah, it's yeah. a voice they're, yes. they're saying yeah, here's yeah. here's a medium where we're you know most of the time the brunt of the joke or yeah just overall just hated sure here we're gonna come into this medium and we're gonna just have a voice in it and and uh there's been a few acts that stood out with me like crimson thorn was a pretty brutal brutal Christian. dude luke reno is a freaking animal man right dude and x toll like they were great right all these the, the and and i just always applauded that because I'm all I'll, technically have always been on the sidelines of the religion thing since I, you know, high school. Maybe I decided after that I was an atheist for a little bit. And so I was always on the sidelines. Now I'm definitely in the agnostic area yeah, as a 38 too. year old man. And um, I just, I just applaud anything that makes people happy. I don't, if it doesn't like impose on anything else that you're doing in your life and they're stoked, like, why the fuck and that's why joel's one of my best friends because that's exactly yeah. where i'm at dude like yeah yeah it, like, i don't I like, I like people a... happy i like humans that are happy it's like well, oh you know. yeah you're, 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 you're you, absolutely the thing is man is that that album came out you know and again it was it was a very early time my space was going on there wasn't a lot of you know and now if i would have done it would have blew up i would have got out to people i would have sold copies i would have had i would have talked about it. i would have been on interviews i would have we would have really been able to push the album and again, it was a very, like you said, Joel, it was a, it, at that time, it was kind of unique. It wasn't a lot going on with that. You know, it was very, mm -hmm. as I, before you got on, I, we were making sure my cameras and stuff were working. It's it, my, my guy that runs the label said, Jordan, Christian death metal is very difficult. It's a niche within a niche. He said, death metal is a niche. And he knows what he's talking about. Cause he's, he, remember, remember malicious hate? The old mm -hmm. run, dude, he was the front man for malicious hate back in the day. Oh, now he's a reformed Christian who runs this label. So he knows what he's talking about. He's an OG. He's been doing this for a million years. Mm -hmm. So basically, all that went through, cesspool of vermin starts, right? So that's just mm -hmm. Jay and this old guy, uh, Derek Haymore. And Derek Haymore was – I left him out because he's a multi – he's a very terrible individual. Yeah. But he was he, he was in Lust of Decay at the first Maryland death test. We, we were in Lust of Decay. He played bass. you know. So he was a part of the band for a minute. Cesspool of vermin starts, right? All of a sudden, they're on MySpace. Dude, demo, two, three songs. They put this up one day. They already have like 2,000 views. I'm like, back then, that was legit. Yeah, yeah. People were going nuts over it. I mean, I was like, right. he was like, dude, you want a drum? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So I had a month to learn the songs. We went in the same studio with Bob Moore. And that album was that first cesspool of vermin. That was a thick album, dude. That's Brutal sick. Album. You're right. I hate the cover art. I didn't even know what that was going to be like, dude. Jay had death threats from PETA. Ooh, PETA yeah. was bro. That I, I, when I saw the cover, I'm like, Jay, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I've got a girl, a girl getting humped by a pig. Like, what are we talking about here? I'm like, it's like all the art you put your like heart and soul into. It's just like a pig, like fucking. <laughs> dude, and it looks real. Like the scary thing is, like we had a Flegaton, Flegaton art. He was really good, and yeah. Flegaton mm -hmm. did a lot of crazy albums. He did a. Uh, so many, uh, I think he did a couple comatose, comatose albums of it, but it looked real. 
And I was like, dude, I ain't got no part of that, man. I was just a drummer. And I, right, I, right. I, I jump ship quick on that crap because I'm not dealing with it. You know, that's what I kind of figured with you, you know, and your faith and all that. I was like, I, I, I know for a fact that with all the album covers and, and content that comes along with all these albums, I know he's just like, you know what? I'm just contributing my craft. I'm going to do the best at my instrument for this project. I enjoy playing this style of music, but yeah, sure. yeah. everybody else has free reign at all the other bullshit. It, Cause I was like, there's no way that this guy is, has condones that necessarily other than right, but you yeah. can just uh, you can you, you can separate yourself from that i you just know yeah i mean it, hearing your 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 uh come up in music and how you always just paid attention to the drums it's still just like that with how you are with your projects you're just paying attention to the drums yeah i mean that's i was gonna say pretty much the same thing you were gonna say it but in a different way asking like how like because you're in the style of music obviously it's not a sure. big they're, they're not like huge christian fans you're walking into the style of music and and you are um how do you like in your heart with dealing with people that are like fuck what you believe in great question great yeah question. Like, how, how do you how do you deal with it because i mean if i like what would my my brain automatically like goes to like yeah you'd be like fuck this i'm out but like you're sticking around and playing in the, in the genre and stuff like that still. And yeah. how do you separate that from like you're playing and the, the genre sure. that you're in? Well, it's a very low, it's, it's, it's a loaded question and it's a loaded answer. So yeah. I'm loaded yeah. right now. So yeah, and, yeah you're right. <laughs> and we, we got the trapity effect going on. We got the, I call it the trapity effect. So we got the <laughs> eyes going. We got like, oh, dude, go. I'm definitely, I'm definitely, uh, <laughs> It's a trap. Infused. It's I'm infused <laughs> right now. We got the Joel Surge alert and the Anthony Stone alert. Right now. I'm, drinking, I'm drinking vodka tonight. So I'm being... After cesspool of vermin happened, I don't think there was much more that happened. After. I can't really remember my disc. I put out, if I count up everything, it's almost like 20 plus releases I've done. So there's quite a bit of releases. And the funny thing is most people are like, you played on that? I'm like... Nobody really even knows who I am, which is kind of funny. It kind of makes it cool, I guess. Yeah, it does. Totally. Like, dude, you yeah. played on all that rips. But um, yeah. anyhow, I want to – so kind of, Joel, to kind of answer your question, to kind of, we got to yeah. rewind a little bit. So we were at – I was at the last fest with Lust of Decay in Illinois. Matt Bishop was a dear friend of ours, and he always – he loved Lust of Decay, so he always gets us on there. Hmm. So we're at the last fest in Urbana where Vital Remains is playing. Now, this is – you know, I'm going to probably get some black and I really don't care what people think about me because I'm not here. I'm not here to impress people. I'm here to tell yeah. the truth. I'm here to give what my life is about. And what yeah, I'm that's what doing. we're asking for. Absolutely. So basically, this is a pretty gnarly story. A couple of things happened. Number one, I started getting burnt out. Now, obviously, I'm in love with Lust of the King. We're actually going to put out a new material and I cannot wait till you guys hear it. It's so freaking good. I'm so down. Oh, yeah. I, guys, I honestly, I cannot wait to hear the new material. No, I hear you mention it. When you post your videos and I we get a little glimpse of what's going down, dude, and I I enjoy watching those videos a lot, dude. Yeah, it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. You know, it's great too. We're having fun doing it, and that's what counts. We're totally, yeah. That's so exactly anyway, what it's about. We're yeah. at this fest, right? So here I am, right? I'm warming up, right? I'm getting ready to warm up for Lust of Decay, and I'm very regimented. So I ha I have a I have a thing. I mean, Joseph even saw me like I would talk to people then I would just disappear and I'd be in the back room and I'd be warming up for 45 minutes, my feet, my hands, just to be focused. I take my ephedra. I take my pre-workout. All my What's caffeine. ephedra? What's ephedra? Ephedra gets it, 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 it. It's basically a bronchial dilator. It opens up your it opens up your breathing. It also is a stimulant. So it makes you go, ah, you know, well, uh, crystal meth, right? <laughs> legal, it's legal crystal match legal. <laughs> Had the cops knocking on my door wow man. dude that's crazy it gives you like a little more breathing power it gives it, you yeah. more it opens up your bronchial tubes but i just you know and then you get more oxygen which gets you more jacked sure. and boom well we're getting older to it it messes your prostate up you can't really piss really good after for about an hour but then it's oh, okay. really yes yeah, and then you just then you're well leaking. that's a strange thing it's like oh yeah. dude, you could breathe better but we're gonna fuck your prostate up for a yeah little not, you're not drinking too many beers after but basically <laughs> um we were we were warming up and it gets a coffee and ale <laughs> that's we good were warming up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're warming up right and i see dude i see 
I'm, I'm going to not say the band's name to be professional. All These right. dudes are like almost gangbanging this chick behind me. So I was, I look around. I'm like, you freaking guys mind? I'm was warming it, up. Was Take it, it odious mortem? <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't that we you never. Know. Know. <laughs> These guys are like, dude, and, and the thing was, dude, this chick's, husband, this chick's husband was a Marine out in Iraq. <laughs> Dick. Right? He's out in Afghanistan serving our country, and this chick's skanking around with these dudes. They're warming, up. they're doing this behind me, so that pissed me off. I was already getting fed up with the scene to some degree because I was sick and tired of he said this and I'm you know competition and this guy sucks and this, I'm so sick of it, man. I mean, honestly, guys, I really was getting to a point where I was just I was ready just to hang it up and be done because I was right, over yeah. I was over the attitudes and the problems. So I got that stupid shenanigan going on behind me. Well, they were watching Vital Remains. Vital Remains was the headliner of this of, of this fest, right? Now we know mm-hmm. that 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 got a crowd going. So they're hammering the nails of Jesus, right? They're, they're, they're you know, which I'm just like this and rolling my eyes. I'm just I'm just like whatever. So I'm next to Steve, right? And Steve's mm-hmm. running his distro. This is really eerie, and this is where I, as a Christian, I know spiritual attacks. I see things that go on. I've seen it before in my life. There was a guy there, man. I'm telling you, man, it was really unsettling. Something about this guy just, it was, it was off. We've been around, I mean, you guys, you guys know you were torn. You've been around thousands of different people. Totally. Sometimes people are a little off, but this guy, something was up with this cat. Yeah. And you get those, there's that at least one person you've come across on tour where you're just like, I I don't even want to be around that. Yeah. This guy might shoot the place up. It was unique. So this guy, they're hammering the nails. Guys, I'm telling you, almost 800 people in this place. He turned around 180 and looked at me and starts laughing and he's shaking his head. And I, I said, you know what? It was like, it was like Satan giving me the middle finger. Like it was a joke. Like it was funny to this guy, but he, somehow he knew I was a Christian. Now people were like, oh, it was coincidence. This was not coincidence. Not with 800 people in this place. That's not coincidence. Yeah. It was very evil. It was very weird. It was very unique. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I, I've got to, I've got to get away from this for a while. I needed to become a better man. I at the time I wasn't really dating anybody serious, but I was like, I've got to, Jordan's got to become better. In order for me to flourish in anything in life, I've got to become better. And then finally, like I'm this is like in my 30s. And finally, I started really going to church consistently. I started really following Jesus. I stopped, you know, sleeping with chicks out of wedlock and things like that. I was, I was really trying to do what God called me to do. So basically, I walked away from Lost of the K. I walked away from, I met my wife and she is, she's just, thank you. Um, she's a great, I'm just a great woman and strong Christian. And, uh, you know, and she totally supports everything that I do. Everything. She's a really good right. person and really supports me. But I had to, even no matter what she said, I finally eradicated myself from the scene. I walked away from mm-hmm. death drama for five years. I, I walked away for five solid years. No double bass, no blast beats. No, I played drums for my church. I still played. I never mm-hmm. stopped doing that because God gave me hands and feet to play. He's yeah. given me a body to play for His for him. He's, my talents are through him. So what happened was how In Concord came about was... And Joel, this is answering your your question. I know I have to pi- I have to piss really bad, so. Uh... <laughs> Look, actually, I'm going to go ahead and piss. You go ahead and piss. We'll all come back in a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How about uh, Anthony? And yeah, Joseph, me and Joseph. Joseph you want to talk? Why don't you break it down? We'll hold it down. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the cliffhanger, dude. Yeah, dude. So we didn't even really talk about the tour that you were going to. Last Lucy and Dreamer just talked about some. Shows, it's a show. Dude. It's 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 a single. Oh, show. just a show. I oh shit. I thought it was a tour, dude. What the? Wow. It's it's going to be a weekend for Lost to Lucy. So the tour is Ethereus, who uh, I played when I played drums for Ominous Ruin on the August yeah. tour. That was yeah. Ethereus headlining. So they're out on a tour again, and when they've come through California, they're doing San Diego, Long Beach. That will be both with Lost to Lucy. The Long Beach show, we're adding Dreamer, so I'll do a double duty night. Dude, that how cool is that? Dude, we've been talking about Dreamer for a long time. Now Dreamer has some some things going on. That's exciting because, uh, in all honest, in all honesty, I thought since Zenith passage just been you know snowballing yep. pretty fast lately. I thought Dreamer was going to be a backburner thing. So. 
what happened was Chris joined Zenith and it was on the back burner last year. And as soon as he went into the studio with Zenith, we are in touch with that producer and that producer is going to do the dreamer record. And we are currently recording all the material for the record uh, starting pretty much right now until April. So we're in recording mode right now. That's it. Really, really really time, so. a dreamer, dude, I'm telling you right now, you're a freaking freak. Well, thank you. Yeah. Man. No, Joseph I mean, seriously. A madman. When I, I, I didn't know who you were. Like, I remember I befriended you on Facebook. I didn't really, I heard of you. And I'm like, let me check this guy out. Dude. Uh, yeah, dude. I'm like, what is this? I mean, and you know what I love about you? You're such a nice, quiet, like you're the opposite of me. Such a quiet, humble guy. <laughs> and I, I really gravitate to that. So when I see a drummer that's like of your demeanor, just low, cool, calm, you know, professional dude, married man. And you're getting after it like that. Like that's like your little left field. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So to see you fill the shoes and drum the way you do, dude, if you guys got that dreamer on a label, we're talking, we were just talking about that. Uh, that was like the topic of, you know, me and Anthony, while you're away, uh, we are going to record the record independently, but we have yep. talks with labels who might pick it up after it's recorded. Uh, we are working with a very good vocalist. We're going to announce the vocalist. I was at his house yesterday with the, local members in la we're going nice. over the demos of the vocal material uh it's gonna be fucking rad man this that album is gonna be really sick and beyond that chris beauty has the next album already written he's sitting on another ep that we, i don't know what we'll do yeah. but we have a whole other ep so this is like if if a band wants if a label wants to sign it's like we can tell you what the plans are for the next five or so years so we got it we got it going already you know it's funny you guys, like I heard your stuff is next level. And I was going to give a shout out. Like, dude, I emailed Maddie Way. I said, Maddie, mm -hmm. I said, it's been a minute. How you doing? I said, look, I'm telling you right now, I know metal and I know talent. There's a band you got to hear because this is the next Cycrop. These guys are the Cycroptic of the USA. Wounds from Illinois. Mm -hmm. Drop the mic. <laughs> My boy Nate All right. is one of the... I'm telling you that it's bold statement, and I am a metal snob. A lot of the, like I always give rap, you know, half Happy Al Fernandez grief because he's he's such an awesome guy. Because dude, he listens to everything. I am not that guy. And my boy Nate, not only are we just close, very close friends, and he's just an, he's one of the most amazing drummers I've ever seen. But dude, when I got to watch them live, it was watching Psychroptic on stage. That's he's Psychroptic of Illinois. I mean, little, little, little. Yeah, I've heard I've heard of the band, but I've actually never checked it out. I'll I'll peep it. Anthony, I'm telling you, these boys are next damn level. I okay. sent the guitarist a message the other day. I said, "Bro, whatever you do, do not stop what you're doing because you won't get that back. That's you rad. need to pursue this." What you band? Need... I was pissing. Wounds. Oh, wounds. Uh, okay. Okay. So their first EP is the I mean, yeah, their first is is outstanding. They yeah. I got to hear their full length. Mm -hmm. Unique leader or nuclear unique leader, one hundred percent. I said I was telling Anthony. I sent Maddie a message. I said you need to hear this band. Nice. These yeah. boys are the real damn deal. Oh yeah. All right. So, yeah, we'll peep it. So we're talking about. Um, okay, so we're talking about how I, I walked away from the scene after that happened, and I I came back home and just honestly, man, I just you know I had my drums in storage, and I just you know I was I was going to church playing, I was playing all the time at church serving because I really I really love that, and just you know really reading God's word every day, really focusing on prayer, focusing on just serving and just working hard, just working out, just things that I do normally, but just really cutting out the cursing. I, I was never a drinker. I mean, you saw me have a couple beers tonight, but I allow myself a beer a day. That's really it. I never got drunk. Oh, good. I've never been high. I've never been high. I've never been drunk. And I'm not judging you. You're I'm high on alcohol, though, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely. A couple of times, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a fan of, of, of some good brew. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, even then, I wasn't even, I never even drank. You know, I wasn't doing anything. Yeah. But when I, once I met my wife, you know, we were really courting each other. And um, and like I said, I'm getting to a getting to a place to, see, to really answer your question, Joel. Yeah. That, I realized for my dude, I had like a ten thousand dollar CD collection. I threw everything in the trash. Yeah, yeah. everything in the trash. <laughs> Gospel chops lost the decay. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Those dudes are bad drummers. But um, I literally, dude, I, I just felt a call, and God was like, you know what, Jordan, it is time to clean the entire slate, and let's. We just need to start fresh. So honestly, 
once in a while, I'd say, what's new? And see if there was a new death metal band. But dude, guys, I didn't listen to death metal. I listened to gospel. I listened to Christian contemporary. I just had to get my mind. This uh, For that five years you're talking about, right? Totally. It's kind of, that's it's kind a of long like time. Smelling, it's smelling the coffee beans in between the cologne, like kind of like refresh. Your exactly. Palate. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a reset. One, or ginger between sushi rolls. and. No, oh, you guys are making great. Cleanse the, it's cleanse the palate. <laughs> cleanse the palate. How to cleanse the soul. So the crazy thing was, um, here's a quick, 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 crazy story. So one day I was at jujitsu, right? Um, and I was training with the guys at the time. I was like a, like a two stripe blue belt and dude, I went up against this, this black dude. This guy was super, super awesome. Nice guy, dude. This guy was a four stripe purple. So he was, I'm sorry. Yeah. Four stripe purple. This guy was a black belt. Yeah. This guy was almost tuning his black belt instructor up. This guy was a freak. He competes. Kind of like you said, you play 40 shows a year, like you're good at playing shows. You play consistently. This guy competed 35 times a year. That's a yeah. lot of competition. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. That means combat. You're, 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 you want to fight. You want to yeah, fight. Yeah. So, so this guy was tuning me up, cleaning my clock. But he was so friendly about it. Like he'd get me in an arm bar. Like, yeah, right? I'm like, yeah, great. I'm just getting my head <laughs> in. So long story short, it was very cold in the gym. So it was tough to get warmed up. And uh, something happened where – he got a hold of my collar and I wound up, he just like tripped me and I fell. But when I fell, I felt a snug, like kind of like a tug in my stomach. I'm like, Ooh, so I figured it was a cramp, right? No big deal. So we kept rolling we kept going and dude, it, it really, really started hurting. So I, I tapped him like, he's like, you okay. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not okay. Like guys, I was in, I was in so much pain. I don't know what happened by my instructor saw me. He's like, Jordan, you all right. I'm like, nah, sir, I got to go. My wife, my wife at the time, she was an x-ray tech for over 20 years. I said, babe, can I get an x-ray? Came down, x-ray, nothing was broken. So what happened was, dude, I tore my abdominal wall all the way through. Yeah. This is brutal. I'm telling you guys something <laughs> right now, that is the worst injury. Besides breaking a femur, it absolutely was terrible. Yeah, yeah. So uh... I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even barely drive. So basically what happened was I wind up going, going home taking medicine, getting better. But every day I'd go in, in my son's little playroom and I would just stretch out. And um, yeah, is that a thing? <laughs> it was definitely something. But uh, basically I was stretching out. So when I would stretch just to try to get my body limber, I, was read, I would read God's word. So it just, he spoke to me. He says, Jordan, now's the time. Get back on your kit, make music glorifying me, get out of the metal scene and help people, love people, talk to people. And I can almost, I can't even almost say it without crying, but it, it, it just, it, it just moved me so much. And dude, lo and behold, even injured next day, I got down my pads, my iron Cobras and I started jamming and it took a solid three months to get things going again, about a solid six months to really get back in the zone. But I started, I already had and conquered all the album written on guitar. And I just finally, man, um, I just started speaking with Dwayne. How it, everything was God, how everything worked out. It just, Dwayne signed me um, on CMU, which is their sub label, Christian Metal. Who wants to feel you out? Make sure you're going to do the right thing. Make sure you're going to be on a Christian label and not, you know, posting that you're sleeping with, you know, five chicks every single week. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. I want that, man. Like, dude, we're a Christian label. We're not about doing stupid things. Like, seriously, it is what it is. Mm hmm. So basically, it's like rappers. Sorry, rappers with like the cross, and they're just like fucking like a thousand girls in there. <laughs> it's like I don't know. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, all right, guys, like, God, we, fuck God, grace. It would like, take us four, like fucking like pounding away. <laughs> it would take us four podcasts to go through all of this stuff. And, and I, no, I know, I know. People oh, hypocrisy. People believe in God, and may, many people believe in God, but they don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So what <clears throat> what what I was called to do was. I felt in my heart that I was called to finally get back in the metal scene again and to infiltrate the metal scene, not as a barstool preacher. Those are dangerous people. Infiltrate. Infiltrate. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Was, yeah, that, 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 that word slipped through there. Like, to yeah. fucking infiltrate them. Yeah. Get in there. So you're a spy. You're a spy. <laughs> like, oh, he's a great example. Joseph, your wife, I hope she's doing good now. I remember your wife was dealing with some serious health stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw that and that really moved me. I was praying so, for her. Yeah. And when I saw Joseph, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, how's your wife? 
Yeah. It wasn't about metal. It wasn't about playing with freaking Angela Cho, which is awesome, and Diego. It was about, how's your wife? Let's talk about what's important here. We can lose our hands tomorrow. We could lose mm -hmm. our legs tomorrow. What's mm -hmm. important is your wife. She's more important in drumming right now. How's she yeah. doing? So it's showing people human element of compassion and caring. They're like, wait a second. This guy's world-class musician and everybody cares about me. Not about what I can do, what I can help him making music. It's about reaching out to the lost, helping people, loving people. It's not about judging people. There's been times where I was at a show where I had an Inconquer disc and I saw somebody totally tatted up and it's pentagrams and 666 and F Jesus and this. Okay, dude, that's your, that's your business. That's not my business. My business is to love you. So I give the guy a disc and it's like, thanks, man. My disc is to, my, my goal is to have a conversation with somebody like, what do you, so dude, what's this in Concord about? And just tell them my life story. Tell them what, if they give me the chance, tell them what I'm about. And mm -hmm. guys, I'm telling you, you'd be amazed how many times tell me about this, Jesus. I want to hear more about him. And that's awesome. That is my, that is why I do this. I love Lust to Decay. I love those guys. We make great music. And I wouldn't play Lust to Decay if they sang about hurting babies. That I absolutely, if an annihilator, if I ever see those guys, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> I hate, I hate guys that talk yeah, yeah. about raping babies and hurting children and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I that's funny child. at all. Anthony, you have that's children. Not, you that's not funny at all. Name. It's not funny. Yeah. It's that's, disgusting. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. I've actually denounced writing like that very early in my yeah, that's, career. Dude. That's, I mean, a lot of us do. We're like, we're the, the, the gore stuff, just gore in general. We were like, all right. Like we we have there's so many other things to talk about than just like I mean yeah let's be honest we're 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 used like it's, the voice is a fucking instrument as well there's so certain it, albums that have been grandfathered in that yeah and they get a pass kind of yeah, yeah a little exactly. bit because they got us into the thing but, but really like that yeah. that part will still be on, on like in the background of ooh this is too cringe i mean butchered at birth i mean come on you talk about butchered at birth like <laughs> like anal blast for example <laughs> i'm just saying no anal yeah, blast anal is a great blast. example they're that's grandfathered in this yeah, is something yeah, yeah. that i i recently that's listened horror movie to. stuff it's not like actually what they want to do it's just horror movie you know it's like i recently yeah. listened to vaginal vampire yep by <laughs> anal blast recently and there's some pretty rad parts of that album dude but it, it the the porno grand thing is just so cringe to me at the same time yeah, it's like a, you know? it's not even like it's not the, the fact that it offends me what they're saying it's like come on guys like you could do better than this <laughs> I know, like I, I i get i get what you're going for with the with the comedy you think it's funny yeah and when you yeah. first hear it as a kid you're trying to push the limits so that's all i mean right. that's where that came from is just pushing limits it's like pushing boundaries to where you're uncomfortable and I get that. That's what fucking Black Sabbath did. They were like, people were like, this is the fucking, we need to burn Black Sabbath alive. This is the worst shit ever. And then there's bands coming yeah, up going like, yeah. like right. saying the worst things. That you read the lyrics ever. and they're just fucking gurgling. They're not saying them. They don't, they can't well, say them. <laughs> with Lust of Decay, with, with Lust of Decay, Jay knows, Jay knows with me, there's go to's and no go to's. There's mm -hmm. no kids. There's no satanic stuff. I'm, right. I'm not going to do it. You want right. to do that? You get another drummer. No problem. Right. I could fill in for many other bands that could that would love to bring me in back on board. Totally. Turn down multiple recording sessions for bands, getting focused on other stuff. And I'm not popping my collar. I'm just saying that I am wanted by other people. If you're going to sing about that, we're not going to do it. Yeah. But what Jay does, I love what Jay does. The reason that I've always uh, I play with Lost of Decay is Jay finds if he actually finds wild stories, real stories, stuff that we'd see on the news. I don't have a problem with that. Because this is this is facts. This is crazy stuff that people had. Like, there's you wait to see the, the lyrical content of this new album. Um, give you an example. Um, one of my favorite songs, and I've actually I did a video on this was um, um, "Desiccate the Epithelia." So this is a crazy story. I read the article on this. So this is a crazy story. I don't even know the town it was in, but this guy had a little little stop and shop out in the country, and he was known for his jerky. People stop by and get his jerky. Well, P.S. And people are like, dude, what is what? Nobody knew the recipe. Well, P.S. Like either Alberto or one of the Slim Jim, one of the big guys said, let's go find out what this is about. Dude, they assayed it. Uh, there's a reason why his helpers, two of them were missing. He used their flesh to make the jerky. Whoa, he was doing human jerky. 
He finds real stories. So desiccate the epithelia. Like Jay will be like, hey, people were awesome. down. They're like, oh, this is the best shit ever. Dude. Jay will get on stage yeah, like this. Star Wars. Jay will. <laughs> Jay will do. A Randy sack like macho, yeah, snap into a slim gym, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> slap into a slim Jim Johnson. He's such a character, but no, his lyrics are about crazy real things that have happened. And he he just basically writes the story and his lyrical content about it. I don't have a problem with that because it's news, it's something you could actually look up. And again, I'm not judging people. It's that, but when it comes to like kids and stuff like that, I have a big problem. Yeah, that's weird. I have, that's a big, weird. I have a son, and I'm telling you right now, I bury somebody in my backyard or somebody. Yeah, hurts. yeah, no yeah, problem. Yeah, easy. Like, you know, but at the yeah. end of the day, man, for me, starting in Concord, you know, was was a, a passion for it's it's a it's a passion thing. It's something that I truly I love playing for us. Yeah, but I am hardcore passionate about in Concord. I totally get it, dude. It's your it's your avenue. It's your way to express your full metal self with including your faith and everything about you right. in one project. You're 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 offering your services to all these other projects, but it really isn't you expressing yourself to the full capacity other than your percussion that you add to the the album but right. this is your way to say okay i i love metal but i also love my faith and and right. and these are the things that i want to express lyrically as well as the what i'd like to make the melody sound like with the guitar and you're just taking a hold of every aspect of it yeah and yes, yeah. I, just I just don't want people man you know at the end of the day man and, and i'll get flack for saying this and and, and that's that's okay I have to answer to God one day when I'm before and when I die. And I just don't want people to go to hell. I want people to, I want people to be with Jesus. And and to me, for me to be able to put out the project and to have the conversation, if it's just one person that I help, I had a guy message me one time and I don't tell many people these stories because God tells me, don't tell the left, don't let the left hand say what the right, tell what the right hand is doing. Meaning don't brag about helping people. If you give somebody money, don't say, Hey, look at me. I'm doing this. That's, yeah, I hate that shit. That's that's not right, you yeah. know. But I had a guy. This guy's got big, like really major autism, and he reached out to me and he said, "You saved my life." Like, come on, man. No, like, no, that's right. Yeah. If Those I can help cool somebody, things, dude. yeah. If, if somebody could potentially stop committing, potentially going to hurt themselves or kill themselves or something, we've seen some really big tragedy happen in our scene lately, man. Totally. You know, yeah, like excessive suicide. Yeah, excessive. I mean, I mean, the yeah, guy yeah. killed himself at Maryland Death Fest. Like, what are we talking about here? Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, it's freaking yeah. terrible. I can't save the world, but I tell you what, I can do. I can help one person at a time. Somebody's going to get my disc and go, "What is up with this?" They matches this guy. We can have a conversation, and then I let them make the decision after. That's why I do in Conquer because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. He is my absolute world, and that is I. I serve Him and Him alone. He comes before my wife. He comes before my son, you know, and my him and then my, my family comes after as he commands me to do. And I'm here and I just do before I take my last breath on this breath on this earth. I just hope that I can impact many people. So that's. Yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome, man. I mean, I mean, for me, like if I mean, also, I think it would be uh, it's cool to just promote helping people in general. Like there's there's been times where people have said something to me that was a line where I was going through the darkest time of my life. Sure. Just one thing they said where I, I had crazy intentions and to do something, but they said something to me. Um, just one line, just something that was, you know, like you, they were help. They were out there putting their their heart and soul towards me, going like, "Hey, dude, I care about you." Blah blah. And I was like, "All right, like I'm I'm snapping out of this." Like if you can do anything to help anyone if they're having any kind of like like issue, and you you can read on it and just kind of give them a little kind of positivity, whether it be. Like, you know, with you, with your faith or with fucking Anthony going like, hey, fucking cheer up, dude. Like, this, it gets better. You know, you right. fucking Anthony's helped me through fucking a lot of shit in my life. But, uh, you know, and only Anthony that's what, knows. That's what bros but, do. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's well, literally. Anthony's got miles. Anthony's, Anthony's got, and the thing is, I can, I can esteem Anthony because Anthony's got three children. He's married. He yeah, understands. Yeah. He understand. First of all. We marriage is, is not easy. It's 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 a focus daily. It's a focus on making your marriage yeah. work. It's, and you having a 
having to balance finances. So when you have a guy that's weathered through the storms, he understands yeah. what it's like yeah. to raise children, what it's it like to be married. It's a storm. It's a storm. I love weathering that storm, but it is a task to, to, to balance developing personalities and and relationships and 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 mm. watching your every move and having the full-time job and paying the bills and yeah dude it's a lot for sure but i think i'm pretty chill going through all of it <laughs> you know you i mean also too i mean jordan you've admitted in the beginning that you were very brass and you're very like a shit talker like you wanted to like piss everyone off around you Shit. and stuff you know what i mean and um i mean like anthony's i don't think anthony's ever really done that i think anthony's kind of just always been in like a, a little bit of a zen state for anthony you know so That's i think different one. different strokes for like helping people and i fucking you know i was actually to be honest with you i was raised and this might i mean i don't can't bum you out but i was raised with a bunch of buddhist monks in a monastery growing up mm -hmm. and they were just like we love you no matter what we love christ we love whatever we love everyone that makes them happy we we're like as long universal as they love right yeah universal like no matter what like and maybe the end result isn't like the the same thing that um as far as like what you align with but right. at, the, at the same time they were like there'd be people protesting them and they'd go outside and talk to them and then they'd put their signs away and be like all right like you're chill <laughs> like sorry. at the end of the I, you day know I mean? like yeah at the end of the day what what's better than just being around a person who can smile and laugh with you yeah, smiles are huge like, smile, smile and laugh is, dude like that yeah, yeah. that you th to if you're gonna be in the presence of another human if you guys can smile and laugh more than any other thing during that experience, it doesn't fucking matter how you guys got to the point of smiling and laughing together other than helping humans. You're smiling and laughing together because yeah. you're being in the moment. It yeah. doesn't, yeah. it does not matter. So exactly. that's, that goes back to that. It doesn't matter as long as you're happy. I want to be around happy humans. I want to smile. I want to laugh. I want to, I want to laugh until we cry until our, abdomens are sore we're holding yeah. each other and each other's stomachs just like oh dude that was, you know that those moments are what we all oh, totally. strive for dude and totally. however you can get there dude i'm all for it that's what's I've up had, you know? i've had a lot of conversations man i have a lot of customers and we've had many conversations you know at the end of the day you know they're not just credit cards to rent up the human beings and emotions that things are going yeah on. Yeah, yeah exactly and that's a good thing and, you know, I've been able to actually have a conversation with some customers that found out they had cancer or something. We've talked about Jesus. We've talked about a lot of good things. And I've always talked about, we're talking about smiles, right? I've, I've said that don't ever discount the strength of a smile. I said, so put yourself in yeah. this position. Say you're in a shopping center. And I've said this to, I probably said this 30, 40 times to different customers or people I've talked to. I said, put yourself in a shopping center. Right. We know that we go to shop and center of focus, right? Steak, chicken, rock, whatever getting for the during the week. The one person that you smile, the one person usually half the time and not even paying attention to what's even going on around you. We're all guilty of it. Everybody's grinding. But say hypothetically, you start to smile at people. Say mm -hmm. one day you actually see a John Doe or John Doeette and you smile at them and they kind of acknowledge you. It might be coy, it might be whatever it may be. What if that person was going to put a bullet in their head when they went home? Yeah, yeah. What if you smiled at them and what if they actually for once said, this person made me feel alive. I actually was acknowledged by somebody. They smiled at me. They saw something in me worth smiling because people think very lowly of themselves these days. So what if your smile, just a smile that took you no time to do, made that person go home and not kill themselves? That's yeah. what well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily go that extreme. Just be like. Oh, that took me out of that shitty mood I was in because that person smiled at me. You but here's the thing. I, I use that extreme because people don't think that way because people a lot of times go to the extreme. And it's mm -hmm. unfortunate. But you're right. What if it was just a – what if it just brightened their day? You're right. But I, I always go – make those changes, though, you got to start small like that. Yeah, you're you can't start. You can't – yeah, it's like going to the gym when you tell people, like, the first step is, like, just touching the door handle. Like going right. to the gym, like getting yeah. there, and just 
walking down, the present at the walking gym, to the mailbox it. and then touching it. And then next you walk to the car. Next you walk to the end of the street. Yeah, 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 yeah. Smiles can be free. Smiles can be free. Gratitude can be free. You can do that kind of things for people and it can really resonate with them. But again, not to get on my soapbox about that, but I've always used that extremely. No, for sure. Unfortunately, I've been front row to some pretty bad stuff in my life with Joe dying and my mother's husband killing himself right in front of her. Like I've seen some pretty terrible Ooh, things. I've had yeah, front yeah. row tickets to people getting hurt. And that's why I go to the extreme. I am an extreme guy. I do it in yeah. my drumming. I do it in my training. It's just who I am. You could tell I'm in your face. This is yeah. who I, I don't even sit back and relax. I'm like Johnny Bench freaking over here talking to you guys. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's it's I literally have like uh I mean, I've had a couple drinks now, so I might get a little deep, but uh literally my buddy killed himself a couple weeks ago and uh Sorry. i saw him like in the bar and i was he was just sitting there and he looked bummed out and i went up to him and he didn't want to be talked to kind of he was kind of i just tell i could just get a vibe he's, right. a, he's a bartender at a bunch of bars in, Sa in santa cruz and i went up to him and he was just kind of like kind of he's sitting there he's holding his head though you know like it was kind of like a thing and i was like okay well you know every time this guy sees me he's like open arms so maybe i said something i was like thinking it taking it personally you know i was like God damn. And then all of a sudden, like, he's missing. And then all of a sudden, oh, they found him in his apartment. And I was like, fuck. You know, like, I saw him at the, at the, maybe the, the crossroads. Like, I saw him, like, nice. holding his head a few weeks, a couple weeks before, just going, like, this is the bar. And, like, he's usually like, what's up, Joel? What's going? Blah, blah, blah. You know, let's go. What's the next show? Let's fucking, he's a, a book shows in Santa Cruz, too. So, but like, seeing that and, and, and there's like the guilt of like going, like, fuck. Like, I felt like, I took it personally at the time. I was like, oh, like I'm somehow like he's bummed on me. I was like, oh, like I don't know what's going on. What did I do? You know what I mean? And then, right. but what I should have done is just like go, went over there and just been like a sweetheart to him. Just been like, fucking what's going on? Let's talk. What's going, you know, but you can't never look back on and, you know, no. knowing what's going on. But, no. you know, it's like, it's like the he needed at that time. I saw a human holding his head that everyone loved in Santa Cruz. Like he's one of the most famous bartenders in Santa Cruz. But like he was sitting there just like holding his head, and I was like, "Okay, maybe a breakup, or I have no idea what's going yeah, on." Yeah, no, like that's the real thing is you have really no idea. What's yeah, going yeah, on. it's yeah. like it's like, do you know what numbers the lottery are going to be? It's like the same thing, you know. Like you can't really like pick up on it unless they're going to no. tell you about it. So, <laughs> you... well, the beautiful thing is this: we all, you know, the thing that my wife and I talk about this a lot. Me and her are such regimented in your, you know, people. Then we we get frustrated when people don't do things that they the way we feel we do things the right way, but you realize that that is out of your control and mm -hmm. you can't beat yourself. You know, yet you hurts because I've been there. I've seen it, been front row to it, but you know, you can make the decision to, like you said, smile and just be decent with people, love people. Yeah. When I see people at fest or shows, man, I just, I just love talking to people and hugging people and seeing how things are doing and helping them on stage. Like if they have to break their, I'll help them break their kit down. It's not because, Hey, look at Jordan. Look, he's helping to break people's sets down. Whatever, dude. If people think yeah. they can go piss up a tree. As far as I'm concerned, I'm there to help people, man. Like at the Chicago Fest, I love helping guys. Like I know the stress of trying to set sets up between sets. Oh, yeah, super fucking man, crazy. Let's let, let's break some guys' drums down. Let's get some things going, man. Let's help some people out. Like just right. just be decent, man. That's yeah, that's, totally. You know, just be decent. No, you're you know? giving you're and you're giving that guy a memory of a hey, you know, it, I didn't. I had these guys helping me do my shit. So it made it less stressful. It made the fest a little more fun for me. Yeah. I didn't have that stress of breaking up down or setting up or whatever. It's just absolutely now I could just be here and experience the moment. And yep. Exactly. Yeah. Cause That's you really are thinking about that. Getting up to the fest, you're, you're like, Oh man, it's going to suck having to set up the fucking drum kit. <laughs> then you get oh, there. Fuck, it must like, suck oh, wait, to be a drummer. Wait, Oh, wait, Sorry. here's these guys that are willing to help me right now. Oh, that, well, that, that drums rules, man. But I'll tell you what, I, breaking them up and setting them down sucks. <laughs> I, know, I love I love Anthony talking about like setting up drums. I know. Well, no, I'm putting myself in the <laughs> old dude, old dude, my microphone's out of a battery. He's like, oh, putting oh, myself fucking, in the position of a drummer who <laughs> is, exp is, is, no, I know, I know, not me too, wanting me too. to do it. And then they show yeah, up no, and they're I like, agree. oh, wait, no, here's I the agree. help. And it made yeah. that, that, future trip not even a real thing you know you were future tripping before you got there now you're in the moment and it's not as bad dude yeah, joseph what do you think i think it was rad to have jordan at chicago and uh i just felt like more comfortable with a guy like him around just 
like the fest is going to be okay. Like, you know, he's performing, he's, you know, he's part of the entertainment, part of the talent, but there's always those guys who are willing to do more, go over and above and to fucking keep an eye on things, like make sure that shit doesn't get out of hand. Cause you know, you got a bunch of young people around, you know, like exactly what he talked about earlier. You know, I didn't necessarily want to have to break up a fucking, Sorry, my wife's in the room right now, but uh, a <laughs> situation <laughs> like that, you know? So it's just like, yeah, I'm, I would feel, you know, better that there's people around who are responsible. And, you know, it's fun to get loose and everything. But uh, in the end, you know, I think it's more about those overarching goals of performing well and feeling like a part of a community that's like, in a sense, structured and, and about the music. So, yeah. Right. Well, I do want to touch on this. I know Joseph, we talked about this earlier. You said something about Lakeithia Flame. Yes, finally. Um, we'll yes, well, Lakeithia Flame is just the best band ever on the face of the earth. Great you know, band, dude. Fight me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, but Lakeithia Flame, dude, like I just have me and I think me and, and Raphael. I enjoy the Appalling Spawn stuff too. It's excellent. It's, yes. It's, it's, the, it's the humble beginnings, but like, it's funny, man. Like, you know, not many people know this. And like, I've already reached out to Peter, the guitarist a couple of times. And I heard he's kind of an introverted, kind of a low key dude. So he hasn't responded yet, but I, I messaged him a couple of times and I sent them today. I said, Hey man, I know Tom spoke highly of me and dude, if you're open to it, man, like I'm down to hearing your tracks. I'd love to play look at the, a music with you, you know? So if that could happen, like that would just, Wow! Wash nose, man. That would just yeah, be. Yeah, Jack cool. has some really, really underrated, solid, oh, solid bands, dude. And Tommy I saw, Korn. I Go saw ahead. Tom, I saw Thomas Corn uh, play with uh, his newer black metal band. Um, do you know their name off the top of my head? I don't remember, but it was that in, was uh, that was a guy they all dressed up in the in the outfits. Um, that was oh at uh, Psycho Fest um, last year. Look, I was there. Something was fire um yeah cult of fire cult of fire yep. okay. yeah so i saw thomas play uh it's insane because the that set is over the top hilarious how they just they're the two guitarists or guitar bass they just sit on chairs like thrones and uh they don't fucking look and and thomas wears a huge mask and uh n none of them fucking it's just they just execute and they play like 10 minute songs it's just just it's fucking like, going yeah it's obvious, man. It, just it's, it's, the, people are making fun of black metal bands calling their shows rituals like it's like a meme right now we're all making fun of black metal for how they call that shit but that was like literally like a ritual like that's <laughs> what it's supposed to be so anyway Tom, thomas is it's fucking, a mass yeah, i, want, it's I wanted to say i wanted to meet him but it's you know it's a big fest and i'm in the show and he's in the fucking stage so but that was cool to get to see him and i wish i could have told him how inspirational his record with Elvin Epperis with uh like oh is because yeah it's just so fun and it's so off like there's no click you can tell it's just fucking uh and they don't make records like that anymore Magical. as much as I love to hear it a Magical. little tighter it's like yeah that's you know you can't so it's so great. you know the story behind his drumming on that he was a big fanboy of flow yeah it's like a flow yeah, it's, it's totally totally yeah. you can tell so he was fanboying on that but dude but I, I think that I think that check scene kind of took that flow hyper blast Grimes. and ran with it because there's also uh alienation mental yep. they're oh, totally yeah. they yeah. totally take the hyper blast and run with it and uh t o o h mm -hmm. oh, the yeah. obliteration Whoa. of humanity that is another band that's this avant-garde grind check band mm -hmm that totally has the flow blasts all over the place dude and rumor has it one of them is actually schizophrenic i don't i don't know if that's actually true awesome. but it also gives it a little extra flavor you when you lore. listen to that music you know yeah gives it extra flavor <laughs> Um, <laughs> right, you know, mental illness gives flavor. <laughs> it's in the collection of exotic spices. Well, it, was, it was just cool, man. Like I've always been, I've always fanboyed over Tom, and like what broke my heart. Like I was telling Joseph today, I didn't, I didn't realize this, but I emailed Tommy. I always make jokes in my Facebook. He'll always make like a post, like eating dinner with the wife. I'm like, how about eating some time at the studio and recording on the like eighth? Like I always like, <laughs> I'll, 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 like I, he did a little slap. He's a funny dude. Oh, I'll just hilarious. wear him out, wear him out, and he finally said to me, he "says Man, I, you know, I'm I'm retired. I'm I'm done. I, I played in 
multitudes of countries over 70 shows and you know and, and literally a big fest and everything he says man i'm done i've done everything i want i want to travel but he said jordan i will tell you this 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 just made my day he said I know you don't know this, but I spoke very highly to you, Peter. I said, Peter, I think Jordan could freaking drum amazing for the band. And I was like, what? I'm like, really? Nice, and I just I just wanted to share that because I thought that was such a cool thing to hear because, dude, I've been listening to that album since it came out back in, what, 2000? Yeah. 2001? Yeah. I yeah, mean, early, early for early. sure. And I, could, I listen to that album all the time. And I just, I'm in love with the album because it means so much to me, that album. So it's just magical for me. And just to hear him say, regardless of the fact, you know, they're probably going to wind up getting a local guy, which I don't blame them because it's easier to have a local person. Let's be real. But yeah. it would be cool to freaking jam with Peter on an album. That's no doubt, you know? Mm -hmm. I'll have to shout out Oleg. Um, oh, yeah. He did for, some covers, right? Well, it, not only that, he's the reason why I know about that band uh, on, on uh, the Severed Tour. Mm -hmm. There was, um, cause you know, when you're on the long drives, everybody's contributing. Yeah. C come on, put on this and check this out, you know? And, right. and you really sitting with it, even though I had heard about it and sampled it, really connecting with it, with Oleg, sh like sitting there and shepherding me through the album. Then I totally, you know how you get that sometimes where you just you got the guy who, who who cracked the code and then he's just like let me let me let me take you through this and show you why this is the greatest shit you know yeah and and, and that was one of those moments for me was oleg taking me through that journey so there was a bass player at my college named brian courage he graduated I don't even know if he finished actually, but he was done. He goes to play jazz. He doesn't play metal anymore, as far as I know, but he was a huge metal head. He wore a like Kathea Flame shirt in like 2010, 11. And uh, he, you know, he taught me a bunch of tech death bands. He showed me Gorod and all this other stuff. Um, but I have to shout him out for being into that scene and, and, and tipping me off like unconsciously. And if you're out there, Brian, I mean, I don't think you play metal anymore, but we went and saw some shows together. And uh, he was just the bass, best, best bass player. He's so fucking good. And uh, so, yeah, I go back to like 10 oh, years yeah. of that record, 10, 11 years. And uh, I, I would say that's, you know, that's that's spiritual metal. I don't think it's Christian, but it's spiritual. And it, it was at a time very. when that was very important to me to have in music uh, something like that to balance out. Right, or, you know. right. So so that's that's where I would go and say, you know, I think there should be more bands that wear their spirituality on their on their. Uh, and and, sleeve. And, and, Joseph, and, and Joseph, to add to what you're saying, the kicker about that, right, mm -hmm. is that when I was really wanting, I would always look into the lyrics, and I love the lyrics. It was very, everything was positive and upbeat. It was abstract, but it was positive. It was unique. It, it was almost like uh, it was an, an old man and child. I think it was one of the songs mm -hmm. or something like that, Child and an Old Man or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love how it told the story, but it was it was some kind of a parallel, something he was doing, but everything was positive. But I emailed, I emailed Tom, Mike Thomas. I said, I said, you guys Christians? Like, no, I'm atheist. And, and I emailed Peter. I'm like, you know, are you a Christian? He's like, no, I don't, I don't believe in any religion. But I asked him, I said, I, I, I thought it was unique because I said, what about the lyrics though? I said, I'm just trying to understand because you had such good positive lyrics, you know? I loved how it flowed with the music. What was that about? I never got a response. I'm like, I left it mm -hmm. alone. But, you know, some people, they don't want to dive into it. Or some people that just hit your they don't want to have too long of a conversation. I respect yeah. that. But yeah. you're right. The, the lyrics on that album, no, there will never be an album like that album. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a one hit wonder album. There's nothing ever that's ever going to be like that again. Mm. That's what I love about it. It oh, absolutely. can't be mimicked. It can't be mimicked. I, I will say there should be, there, there might be a renaissance. I've talked about this before that there tends to be like, kind of like 10 to 15 years after certain records, people start to really ask for it and it comes back like focus by cynic and then i think the yes. solo the solo record by frederick thordendahl of meshuga i think came back and i think that elvin Ephrus is at the time it's about ready for its renaissance where people i think it's starting to happen now that at least people are figuring out that this is at least an underground classic as for whether that influences people i sure hope so i'd love to hear more like major chord riffs over hyperblast that's the thing Absolutely. That happen more. but i agree 
I agree that the whole package, it, it can't be done again. It's just, it has that classic era sound. I don't know, you know. So, so well, you know what Tom, Thomas would be like? You're going to be, you know, always say to me with a smiley face, you see, you're going to be so disappointed when you realize it's not the same band. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. The other thing is, I feel like there's like only one crash and one China on that record like there's not a lot of <laughs> it's just like he's like done the hyper on the china and i feel like one crash there's like it's not a yeah, huge drum that's all you need dude so he used um i actually asked him i said i, I wanted to know i said i knew i i because I, I owned an earth ride for years i said mm -hmm. you used an earth ride he said yep i had an earth ride i said like, i'm good and right. i said he played a tama kit three times bass drum double bass pedal which him and I, the running joke with him and I was he hates double bass pedals. I'm a double yeah. bass pedal guy now because I don't yeah. want to lug two freaking bass drums around. And but he used a single single bass double bass pedal and like it was a some giant crazy China. That China was amazing. Mm -hmm. And you're right, it was like two crashes and mm -hmm. hats, and that was it. He had a pretty basic setup, but man, it sounded freaking good, man. Yeah. Yeah, Shout out. let's get I'm, him on a, the podcast eventually. That would be fun. I Tommy love Korn, that, dude. dude. Tommy yeah. Corn, that would be, I would sit there and just eat popcorn <laughs> and drink beer and watch that. Yeah, dude. Hell yeah. The, uh, that's what I, I just wrap it up with. Again, checks have some uh, underground real shit going. The Czech Republic over there, dude. You got to just, they, they took that, that hyperblast, they ran with it and there's some really good bands, dude. I, I think I mentioned all the ones that I love. So check them out. <laughs> check them out. All right. Yeah. I have to pack to go to, uh, Northern California tomorrow morning. Yeah. So dude, I think it's we time wrap we sign up. Up. Jordan, oh, dude. you've done Thank you you. Know, three you've and a half hours. Amazing guest. Yeah. We appreciate you coming on longer. You're on vacation though, right? You don't have to work tomorrow, right? Jordan? No, you me. Oh, I, work, I work to, dude. I'm a nutbag. I'll get up at six. I'll go work. It's one thirty here. I'll get up at six and go work out. I'm crazy. Oh, uh, that's what, uh, yeah. But I'm saying you <laughs> on vacation <laughs> from work. Work. <laughs> I'm a psychopath, man. I I'll go upstairs <laughs> and train. Like I don't care. I, I can. Stay, he I can sleeps in his Bane mask. He. <laughs> I could talk to you guys till five in the morning and just let the alarm not even go off and just go work out and just deal with it tomorrow. Well, dude. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just really talking with the mute on. No, I pretty much average like four to five hours a night of sleep the last <laughs> like uh, three or four months. Fuck. And uh, it's pretty, I mean, you can get there though. I gotta also, go, I gotta get six minimum. Also, too, I've read a, a bunch of like uh, whatever studies that say people that sleep eight hours or more a, like uh, a night, they live significantly less long than people that sleep less. Whoa. So Jeez. look that up, motherfuckers. I'm a scientist. I'm just kidding. All right. All right. Uh, cool. So anyway, so we gotta we're gonna rate someone. Okay, so yeah, so Jedi says that. Mike Mike Sheon treads. So maybe we'll do Mike Sheon. I have never seen him before. I don't know. I've never Mike Sheon. That's a Mike Leon. Mike Sion. So I was gonna say that's really close to Mike <laughs> Leon. So, okay. Shreds. So we gotta yeah, so listen Leon. to classic lust of decay, shuriken cadaveric entwinement, and in Conquered. There's a what is it, an eight album deal? So you're going to be releasing a lot of In Conquered over the years ahead. And go so. back and listen to that Domination Through Impurity stuff. I have yeah. to listen to all that stuff now. I was just yeah. listening to that just now, and I was like, we used to listen to that all the time back at the Odious house. We like, did. We did the bump time. it a lot, dude. That's crazy. Lot. Yeah, I've got just, you know, just an update, people. Just I should be getting within by, I think I already have like 50 copies uh, pre-sold, but which, you know, for death metal is like selling 5,000 in the mainstream. And then... uh I got the new and conquer should be hitting my house at any time. So I'll be contacting everybody that pre-ordered lust of decay is going to be recording uh, our album. Probably I'm probably want to be in probably third quarter of this year. Um, so that album should be recorded. And uh, yeah, that's what's going on right now, man. So I'll keep everybody cool, up. Dude. Again, guys, it, thank man. you so much. Thanks for everyone for fucking hanging out and listening to this. It's fucking it's, always fun. Yeah, and dude. Oh it's yeah, so this is our year wrap up show. We didn't even like year, man, but I know, like like next show, <laughs> next year. Dude, happy new anyway, year. We didn't say happy, happy new year, year in the beginning. Yeah. Everybody have a happy new year, a safe, awesome, rad, happy new year. I hope your resolutions work call out Uber or don't you. drive, just if you're gonna drink. Yeah, call I, Uber. Like I, fucking I, it's worth it. The, it's ten thousand. The philosophy dollars. is a five hundred dollar Uber is worth way more than a ten thousand dollar DUI or a fucking like unpriceable life. There you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
So Mike, everybody Mike, be Mike safe. Mike Leon. Say hi to Mike Leon to everyone. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up and, and send it to, the, to, to Mike Leon right now because I fuck up on raids every time. All right, so dude. We're gonna do it right now. All I right, fuck dude. Up like every time I like send stuff, they're like, you didn't send it. At the, oh, yeah. The we, and actually, uh, to the people in the chat, you're going to Mike Leon. We love you. Yeah. <laughs> Because the wrap up, the wrap up for the Twitch is different for the wrap up for the YouTube. We are too stoned and drunk to figure that out. One hundred and ten episodes in. Go ahead and check to see if it went over there. Because I I literally like, we'll get off. I'm like, fuck yeah, I rated him, dude. And they're like, didn't rate him. Didn't rate. (laughs) I get like all these messages, like texts, like you didn't raid that guy. So whatever you thought you did, you didn't do. Yeah, dude. We're we well. It's the thought that counts. We're really trying over here. we got a gorilla. We got a gorilla on the control. Oh, you can't even turn on a moment. TV, dude. Like I'm. Oh, doing so crazy good. Stuff. Wait, so Joseph, good. is that uh, is that a, a confirmation? No, I'm still. I'm watching on Twitch. It's it's still us. Let's see. It's it's not. Oh well, yeah, right we're now. still on Twitch right now. But Joel, uh, by the way, I just want you to know. I just want you to know. You yeah. had me in tears when you you always have that one one liner each show. And it just kills me. And mm-hmm. Anthony loses it. Dude, you said our boy from Decrepit Burf looked like Chris Barnes. I about pissed myself. When you <laughs> say, dude, I, I couldn't stop laughing. I was almost hyped. I think I'm almost white. On white, the white, Decrepit white. episode, you say? like, yeah, of course. Of course, Six Feet Under is awesome. He also sings for <laughs> Decrepit Burf. Uh, <laughs> and he said, I'm oh, going to go down and I'm going to beat your ass. Uh, <laughs> Isn't dude, that funny that was, how it's like that was absolutely two horrible. years ago? You're like, I said that. Oh my gosh, I couldn't believe you said that. It was great. <laughs> I guess it, it worked. worked. Someone said it so. worked. I'm getting murdered nice. by my, my all right. If it works, it's called Digi Rig. Okay, play the video. Podcast, man. It works. All right. And now he's doing the Kelly. Di- all right. Well, for the yeah, YouTubers yeah. and all that shit and the post Twitch watchers, battleforgecoffee.com. Cali Death Podcast. Big Cartel.com. We'll have some shit when we, yeah, pre order coming up soon. And uh, uh, Jordan, one more time. Uh, oh, Comatose Music, right? Music. Go oh, yeah, there right. for all the uh, Jordan related projects and merch Be more. and distracted. <laughs> New War for he's going through everything. I didn't know you had you have access to that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I do. <laughs> you should you should have access. That's I don't true. have the video. Someone else Sick play the video. No, I got the video, but anyways. All yeah. right. All right. We love you guys. Happy New Year, and we will see you. We got great stuff coming very, very soon. Thanks, Jordan. Rock on. Thanks, love you guys. Appreciate it. Love you too, love man. You, dude. Cheers. Peace Be out. God,